Salutations. Welcome to Pod Mortem. I'm Renee Hunter Vasquez, joined as always by my co host, my husband, and my brother. Hi, I'm John Paul Vasquez. Hi, I'm Travis Hunter. This week, we are recording live from the Sleeping Dog discussing the 2000 supernatural horror film, What Lies Beneath. This film was directed by Robert Zemeckis with a screenplay by Clark Gregg and story by Sarah Kernikan. The screenplay for What Lies Beneath was given directly to Zemeckis by Steven Spielberg with both Michelle Pfeiffer and Harrison Ford in mind for the lead roles. Inspired by Hitchcock and his quintessential filmography, Zemeckis channeled the legendary director for this film. As a result, What Lies Beneath is filled with Hitchcockian influence and homages. Despite reaching number one at the box office, this film was met with mixed reviews. Still, due to its suspense and iconic, memorable moments, What Lies Beneath is a standout in early 2000s horror for those of us of a certain age. This film was requested to us by friends of the show, Megan Martinez, Anthony Jerome M., Bobby Holmes, Jason Kyle OKC, Liz Heath, Sophie Hodson, and Noreen S. We want to thank them all for their support, as well as this suggestion. So. What did you guys think of What Lies Beneath the first time you saw it? Um, fuck, I was a teen already when this <laughs> came out. Mm-hmm. I I don't remember the first time watching it like originally, but I remember watching it and remembering what happens in this movie. It's one of those movies that sticks with you forever. It, it has fantastic scenes like there's moments in this movie that you do you're hanging on and you're just kind of like oh shit (laughs) and i remember as it when i was younger when i was a kid not like a kid kid you know what i mean yeah but i remember being like what the fuck you know not fully understanding but kind of understanding what's going on as an adult fully understanding now i'm just like oh (laughs) shit (laughs) how did i not see any of this shit going on (laughs) Uh, we watch this pretty regularly. Yeah, a as lot. Kids. Yeah. yeah, you said two thousand. Yeah, holy <laughs> shit, <No. laughs> dude! I, I, I was nine. I was nine years old. <laughs> I know, and oddly, this movie was rated PG thirteen. That feels weird, right? It it does. Because watching it as an adult, it feels very adult. Well, like it feels I, like a very adult thriller. Yeah, but I don't think there's any. Uh, I mean, not like adult situations or anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there is one. Yeah. yeah well. <laughs> <laughs> there is an adult situation. Um, but no, I, I loved it back then. I think growing up and watching it as an adult now, mm-hmm. I appreciate all these incredible filmmaking aspects mm-hmm. right. that I did not at all even take into account. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that very often you see on the back of a DVD cover or on a movie poster, uh, does for blank what Psycho does for whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, showers. They they were yeah. theirs were specific. Uh, yeah, yeah, for we, Psycho, we yes, it's, it's showers. Yes, it is showers. But um, for this film, they obviously you hear you heard a lot. It does for bathtubs what Psycho did for showers. Yeah, I think that was kind of their entire point with all these homages. Yeah, mm-hmm. trying to do their own thing. The <laughs> the bathroom's a scary place. It right? is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're always afraid of not having pants on if something happens. Yes. And, and the bathroom is the place to not have pants it's on. It's the it's a major well, place. Yeah. <laughs> it's the main place. Yeah. And it's it's just the vulnerability of it. Like and that's where like you get into the shower, you go take a bath to relax. Right. Yeah. You don't want to fucking, you know, see a ghost face in there. Not really. Not ghost, ghost face. face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um the other kind. Right. Yeah. Uh, separate words. Ghost face. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, but no, I mean, it's it's got really great performances. I'm not going to say exactly what, but I am very appreciative of people playing against type in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And doing so in such an excellent way. Um, I will say for me, I think even with the excellent filmmaking, even with it being uh, honestly a, a kind of an old fashioned thriller mm-hmm. in a modern way, I do think that the script needed a little more work. Oh, yeah. The and the time yeah the, the pacing uh, it's, yeah it's, it's a bit long mm-hmm. i did want to mention i know that i credited him up top but the screenplay was written by agent coulson <laughs> 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 yeah. i was like i'm Get the fuck out yeah, he's like here. a screenwriter <laughs> yeah anyway i That's thought that was great. wild <laughs> But yeah, I've always loved this movie. I was, I guess, 11 when it came out. And (laughs) 
to be 11 years old, I don't understand the chokehold that this movie had on yeah. me. <laughs> I can't relate to anything going on. Yeah. I don't fully understand <laughs> anything going on, but I was just like, my God. No, yeah. I fucking, I loved this so much. And then the older I get, the more I realize that it is so... <laughs> Like bananas that Harrison Ford is even in this movie. Yeah. yeah. That's what I mean. I'm I'm wild. Laugh, I'm laughing because I was trying to go through the entire film in my mind and I was like, there for, there really is nothing to relate to except I, I've taken a bath. That's yeah. it. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's where it. I, that's where I was in my life. But I fu- I fucking <laughs> loved this movie. And so to love it then and then get older and kind of see like, oh, this is fucked up and like yeah an entirely different way that I didn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. Well, even that, I didn't watch it a lot, but I did watch it, and it was one of those movies that played on TNT a lot. Okay. So when it's on, you do want to stop and put Uh, your hands on your hips and kind of like, oh, shit, like, yeah, what's going on? (laughs) Oh, I remember this part. It's going to be good. Yeah. Hold on, I'm coming. It's like, you just want to watch it. It is a good movie, but yeah, getting older and understanding what was happening, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. There are, I mean, a couple plot points that don't, I feel like, fully reach their potential. Yes. But, I mean, I still have a lot of fun with this one. I still really like it. There's moments where you're like, oh, yeah, I I saw that coming. And then there's moments where you're like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just watching it analytically. There are things where I'm like, well, why did you even include that? Because this is, I think it's like two hours and nine minutes. Yeah. And it really, (laughs) it really doesn't need to be. I feel like we added a lot. It's it's very cinematic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it feels like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, watching it this time, I was like, God damn, this is like... And then reading how much influence he took from Hitchcock, I'm like, okay, I see that. Yes. I, I definitely see okay. that. There are some very obvious and awesome homages. Yeah. And then there's some more subtle ones as well. Is there birds? Uh, I believe there's one bird. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bird. There's a bird somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like you said in your intro that it was the Hitchcock influence that was really the jumping off point. Mm-hmm. Robert Zemeckis's filmography is kind of all over the place, mm-hmm. and there is nothing like this in his filmography. Whenever you look at, I mean, the Back to the Future films, Forrest <laughs> Gump, Death Becomes Her, it's wild, <laughs> right? Yeah. But he had always wanted to make a Hitchcock style film, uh-huh. and so whenever Sarah Kernikan wrote this, she wrote it based on a personal experience with the supernatural. Oh, uh, shit. Not what happens in the film. No. I, hope, I hope not. <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> I'm calling the authorities yeah, as I'm we not. speak. <laughs> but the script eventually goes to Clark Gregg for rewrites, mm-hmm. Agent Coulson. And um, he eventually rewrites it in a way that it kind of fits more in line with what Zemeckis is thinking. Right. And then when it finally gets to him, as you said, from Spielberg... Our good friend. Your buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've made some amends. I like how you casually just went by that. I was like, you say I fucking had Steve? It. I yeah. had to Steve it. is a part yeah. of this? <laughs> but um, after it gets to Zemeckis, he kind of puts his touches on it to make it fit in more in line with the thriller that he was hoping to make. Mm. And their entire mindset going through the whole film as they made it was, what would Hitchcock do if he had access to the technology we have today. Okay. And so it's a very interesting, almost experiment. Huh. Because when you think about it, I mean, if you look at a Hitchcockian thriller, a lot of the times in the modern sensibilities, you can probably guess what's going to happen. You can probably, you know. So it's kind of difficult, even in the year 2000, to write something that can appeal to modern audiences with that flair of the classic thriller right right that is interesting i still feel like he'd find a way to terrorize a woman with birds i <laughs> yeah <yes. that's, laughs> technology or no technology that's, yeah. they're just mechanical birds <laughs> <laughs> well we have the technology we do exactly <laughs> But I'll try to call out some of the references because they're very interesting. I know we hear one reference throughout basically the entire film. I I think um, Bernard Herrmann should have gotten some kind of co-writing <laughs> credit or something. <laughs> but um, no, I think I, I, I really do think they did an excellent job on it. And I'm uh, excited to talk about it. Yes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I just wanted to mention before we, you know, break away and jump into the story that Zemeckis filmed this when they were on break from Castaway. That is really because Tom Hanks had to lose weight and grow a beard. Oh, so yeah. in that interim, 
He did what? Like, <laughs> what Dude. the fuck? I cannot switch gears. Buddy, I know. But that is, yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's fucking wild. I got three weeks to kill. Let's All fucking right, let's make a film. Let's do a whole <laughs> film. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> Now, before we commune with this film, we would like to issue a warning for spoilers. Podmortem is a very in-depth podcast, and in thoroughly discussing horror films, we have no choice but to spoil a thing or two. If you don't wish to be spoiled, please go watch the film, then come back and enjoy the show. If you've already seen the film or don't care about spoilers, then let's start to suspect something. The film opens with credits over a body of blue water. We get the title card underneath the water, moving in tandem with the waves before we dive down under the surface. We pass plants before hearing whispers and seeing a woman open her eyes beneath the water. Suddenly, her face changes into that of Claire Spencer, played by Michelle Pfeiffer. I, first of all, we all love Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very shocked because all the times we've watched that movie, I never saw that transition before. Me neither. If if I I did, I don't remember it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a lot to begin with <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's i mean i'm not saying we're giving it all away so right no, but, <laughs> but we're just supposed to be like all right okay, now the yeah, movie's yeah. starting yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. claire woke up that's <laughs> my first thought is what the fuck yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i was pretty shocked i did like the opening through the water yeah, yeah, it was cool. yeah. it's a very nice opening title but she sits up quickly from underneath the water in her bathtub gasping for air she sits up fully trying to catch her breath I did notice right off the bat that her bathroom is white and pristine. Oh, it is. And for most of the film, she is wearing white. Mm -hmm. Like probably half. And then, it, you know, we start adding blues and stuff. But she wears light colors. I, you know. No, yeah. it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's intentional. I feel like Breaking Bad. Ever since it was like, well, he wears this, and then when he breaks bad, well, I was like, fuck. I always, <laughs> I always pay attention to that now. <laughs> it's a clue. It's yeah, uh, you know. But she pulls the plug on the water and sighs. After her bath, she wears a white robe and uses her hair dryer to erase the steam on her mirror. That feels like a life hack that I didn't know. It does. <laughs> <laughs> when the hair dryer turns off, she checks the outlet and it sparks, causing her to scream, but the dryer comes back on. She moves in in circles along the mirror until her reflection becomes clear. Later, she opens the curtains in her daughter's bedroom. Her daughter, Caitlin Spencer, played by Catherine Town, is still asleep in bed. Claire sits next to her daughter, waking her up gently, but cautioning her that if they don't go, they won't be able to leave on time. Caitlin, still half asleep, insists that she's totally ready, but Claire just chuckles at this, smacks her daughter on the butt, and tells her to get up and she'll make waffles. As she walks down the hall, Caitlin requests blueberries. Good call. Right. Claire stops to give love to their dog, Cooper, and straighten a lamp on the table. She's distracted, though, when she hears her neighbor's raised voices. She looks out the window to see a man and a woman on the next lawn yelling at each other. She's startled when someone puts their arm around her, but it's just her husband, Norman Spencer, (laughs) played by Harrison Ford. So, firstly, as I'm watching this movie... I. I felt like some kind of like old casting director because as I was watching, I was like, this guy's a movie star. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he just carries himself in such a way that he you're does. like, I get it. Yeah. But well, he's Indiana Jones. It, yes, yeah. It's very important. Yeah. He, um, him and Michelle Pfeiffer were the first and basically only choices for these roles. They're both All great. Right. Yeah. It's perfect. And they have great chemistry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, that's two Hitchcock references in a row. We got a little bit of rear window and then we got Norman. Norman, yeah. You know? <laughs> like, that wasn't an accident. No, no, no. Not at all. But she giggles as he kisses her cheek and she reports that the neighbors are at it again. Norman remarks that this is the second time in the three weeks that they've lived here. He identifies their last name as Fior and says one of them works in the psych department and that figures because they're all nuts there. He's like, thanks, Norman. Yeah. He kisses her neck, but before things can go any further, Claire says that Caitlin is awake. Norman says they can be quick and quiet, but Claire whispers that she doesn't want to be either of those things. Norman bluntly asks when their daughter's going to be out of (laughs) here. Oh, God damn. (laughs) And Claire jokingly chastises him. In the face of rejection, Norman decides to go for a run, taking Cooper out with him. Before he leaves, he advises Claire that they need to leave by 11 if they want to beat the traffic. Claire has turned her attention back to the neighbor's house, but repeats back... 11 o'clock 
The wife clutches to the husband in their yard, but he pulls away from her and goes back into the house. Later, Claire packs Caitlin's belongings into the back of their vehicle. Caitlin comes outside to remind her mother that she can call her whenever she wants. And Claire tries to laugh this off, saying that she's known this day was coming for a long time. But with Norman, the new house and the garden, Caitlin doesn't need to worry about her. They hug. And when Caitlin can't see her face anymore, the confidence fades and she closes her eyes, holding on to her daughter. It was very sad as it's clear that she's trying to convince herself. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have all these things. I'll be fine. Yeah. Very, very sad. I did want to talk about the house really quick. Mm -hmm. I learned from the production notes that this house was built from the ground up. Really? Yes. Interior and exterior. God damn. It is structurally sound. It no longer stands. They tore it down after production. (laughs) But what the I, yeah, fuck? I don't know. Let somebody live there. <laughs> yeah, it was me. What Let me live there. <laughs> it was beautiful. Oh, that's insane. They um, I think they said it was thirty five hundred square feet, and uh, it was built in Vermont. And yeah. Then they reconstructed it on studio sets in Los Angeles, and so various times throughout the film, sometimes a scene will start in Vermont, sometimes it'll end in Los Angeles. I can't tell the difference. No, that's really impressive. That's seamless. Yes. I did also want to call it the production designers. It was Rick Carter and Jim Teagarden. And their filmography is just like Zemeckis Spielberg, Zemeckis Spielberg. Yeah, yeah. But of course, that means that they did both work on Death Becomes Her. Oh, nice. So, but they do great work. And I love the name Teagarden. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But they're hugging and Caitlin calls out to her mother and the hug segues into them hugging in Caitlin's dorm room. Caitlin continues to call her mom, telling her that she has to go. But it's Norman that has to get Claire to let go, telling her that if they don't leave soon, the school is going to make them enroll. That transition was very slick. Yeah. Yeah. And it was even more sad. Yeah. For me. Um, Norman... (laughs) I, I don't think he cares very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he, a- he's more excited to start a new chapter. Uh, I mean, yeah, but he does seem... He's like, let's fucking yeah, go. Yeah, he's yeah. kind of like, all right, let's, let's get at it. Well, the, the <laughs> fact that when, when I talk to the kids, I don't say, oh, go ask John Paul. I say, go ask dad. Go ask daddy. Yeah. Go ask your dad. She's like, I have Norman. I was like, okay, oh, yeah. so oh, he has right, this, right. a stepfather situation. But we find out later that she was like one when they got together. Yeah. So I, it's. <laughs> that's true. I thought that was Norman's like, yeah, let's get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Does he even hug her goodbye? Yeah. I th- he hugs her and shakes the roommate's hand, I think. Okay. In my mind, for some reason, I just see him checking his watch. No, he <laughs> like bombs her face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ew. <laughs> But Norman does hug Caitlin, telling her to come home often and to be sure to call Claire before shaking the hand of Caitlin's roommate, Beatrice, played by Victoria Bidewell, who sits on the opposite bed watching this entire interaction. He tells her to look after Caitlin and Beatrice vows not to go to a single bar without her before quickly adding that she's just kidding. I gotta be honest, Beatrice seems very cool. She does. Uh, (laughs) I'm digging the vibe of this storm. You got Riot Girl music playing in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Caitlin's going to be fine. She's in good hands. <laughs> Claire hugs Caitlin one more time, but manages to let go in a timely manner before promptly following Norman out of the dorm room. She holds it together, but as soon as she crosses the threshold into the hallway, she bursts into tears. She chuckles tearfully, saying that she almost made it. This was exactly me when Ari, when we dropped her off for the first day of school. <laughs> I made it out of the classroom, and we stepped to the hall, and I was like, ah. Well, it's a big deal. <laughs> you should be allowed to huge. cry. It's yeah. yeah. Nobody's going to make fun. Right, and they shouldn't. No. Um, they're no longer friends of ours if they do. I <laughs> <laughs> I do think, I don't want to say it's a missed opportunity here, but I do feel like uh, as the film continues, there's various reasons to include this Caitlyn character more often. Yeah. But we don't. No. I hope that y'all didn't like fall in love with her or anything because we never (laughs) see her again. (laughs) Not even the end end. No. No. (laughs) It's unbelievable. But that night, Claire opens a window in the bedroom and struts to the bed. Norman sits working diligently on his laptop. Claire playfully picks up one of his books and pretends to read it. When he asks what she's reading, she consults the title and tells him genetic repair mechanisms and eukaryotic organisms. He corrects her pronunciation on eukaryotic, but asks how it is. 
She reports that it's excellent and describes cell division in terms of Swedish sailor cells gang dividing a virginal cheerleader cell. A little <laughs> cell quorum. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? Not a shred, what are not you a reading? crumb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the book looked so official. Yeah. <laughs> but Norman continues to work, and Claire cuddles up to him and kisses him until he finishes and puts his laptop away. She asks how his work is going, and he says that he thinks they cracked something in prenatal targeted repair. She calls him brilliant, and he agrees with her. <laughs> He's also delighted when she adds his name to the likes of Madame Curie and Jonas Salk. He asks how she is, and she assures him that she is fine. He tells her that it's okay if she's not, but she confesses that she's excited to get her life back and have time for herself and for them. Norman says they did a great job because Caitlin is a great kid, and Claire agrees. He reminds her that it's just them now and asks if she's tired. Cooper's like, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. Yeah, fantastic. Go, go, bark, go bark yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Standing in the doorway. Yeah. Mm. Mm, okay, wow. Got it, I, got I it. was going to sleep at the foot of your yeah. bed. <laughs> not tonight. So, so fuck me. Got it. Got it. But she seductively tells him that she's not tired. And when he asks if she wants to fool around, she says yes. She dims her lamp and they start to make out, but are interrupted by their neighbors moaning loudly. Claire looks appalled and begins to giggle as Norman gets up and starts to close the window. He says that they must be making up, but Claire stops him, telling him to leave the window open. He opens an another one for good measure, <laughs> <laughs> accepting the challenge. When he returns to his wife, he tells her to do the brilliant Norman stuff again and to be sure to speak up. The next morning, Claire puts laundry away in Caitlin's drawer. She takes out a tank top and inhales the smell of it, breathing deeply. She looks down at it, and the front of it proclaims Juilliard in faded letters. In the basement, she looks through a photo album at a picture of Caitlin wearing the Juilliard tank top. She flips pages. There's one of her and Norman smiling and holding boxes as they move into their new house. There's one of her and Norman on their wedding day. Another of her performing at Carnegie Hall in 1982 and standing smiling with another man. She looks behind her at her cello in its case and propped up against a wall. So very quickly, two things. I did want to call out the E.T. doll that was in Caitlin's room. Very cool. Uh, <laughs> they just can't stop saying hi to each other through their films. But um, I did think that this going through their history was kind of an interesting way to do it. Yeah. With the photo album. Yeah. It's well, very expository. It is. Yeah. But she has a reason to be looking through the photo album. Exactly. Her daughter just left and yeah. she's, you know. And it's very interesting because you see the Juilliard tank top and you realize why it's faded so much. Yeah. And then her history. Yeah. Which I would like more on. Yes. Yeah. That's one of the things it's like, okay, but that never, I feel like that never fully blossoms. Mm -hmm. It would be an interesting detail. Yeah. But it's kind of just window dressing. Yeah. But pages spill out of the photo album. And when she picks them up, she sees a very serious photo of a younger Norman with his father. Right behind this photo is a newspaper clipping reporting on mathematician Dr. Wendell James Spencer's death at 77 years old. Behind that is a photo of a wrecked car with the note underneath for an insurance claim on August 21st, 1998. Looking at this photo makes Claire lose her breath, but she continues flipping through the album. It's like, did y'all just keep all the bad memory pictures tucked yeah. in one area? <laughs> it's like, whoops, all of our nightmares yeah. fell, out the, <laughs> fell out the back of this Shit. thing. <laughs> but the next photo is of a very young Caitlin's birthday party in 1985, where Claire and another man sit behind her smiling. The next is of Claire holding baby Caitlin in July of 1981, wearing the Juilliard tank top herself. Claire is overcome at this point and drops the photo album on the ground before running outside. She sits on a bench outside and dissolves into tears. But when she gets herself under control, she hears that someone else is sobbing. She looks over at the huge wooden fence that separates their property from the neighbors and walks over slowly. The sobbing only gets louder, and when Claire sneaks up to the fence and steps on a rock to peek through, she sees a blonde woman sitting on a bench with her back to her. I did want to say the peeking through the fence is an excellent homage to Norman Bates peeking through the office ah, wall. Ah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Every reference to Psycho, I'm just going to say uh, 
Take a shower. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Claire calls out hello, but the woman just runs away at the sound of her voice. Claire's foot slips off the rock and she hurts her hand on the fence, but she's not deterred. She continues to follow the woman's silhouette. And when she calls her by name, Mrs. Fuhr, she runs away again. Claire stands staring through the hole in the fence, looking at the front of the Fuhr's house. It's quiet for a moment, but when a big green eye appears in the hole, Claire is scared. (laughs) Why would that be her response? Yeah, no shit. (laughs) Let me take her eye. Oh, someone's concerned about me. Let me slam my eyeball (laughs) against this real quick. Yeah, you can't answer? No. No. You can't. (laughs) Like, that's unbelievable. (laughs) The woman, Mary Fjord, played by Miranda Otto, sobs and speaks to Claire in vague statements. He's just so, it's too much, I can't, I can't breathe. She tells Claire that she's afraid, and Claire asks what she's afraid of. Sobbing harder, Mary admits that she's afraid one day she'll just disappear. So this is horrifying. Yes! Yeah, that doesn't sound good at all. No! No. We need to talk to somebody. Yeah, and then after slamming your eye in the hole and and (laughs) saying that. She's like, I also need to get this eye checked out. Do you see anything in there? I got some splinters in it. (laughs) Fucking eyelash. I can't get it. (laughs) Claire asks what she can do to help her, but Mary abruptly points out the fact that she's never even met Claire. Claire apologizes, saying that she's been concerned, but Mary turns her focus on the fence before running away again. Claire follows her along the fence, asking if she wants to come in for a cup of coffee, but Mary quickly says that he's home. She runs for the front door of her house, begging Claire to forget that she said anything because she doesn't know what she's saying. Claire has lifted herself up and watches as Mary runs into the house, but quickly lowers herself as a vehicle approaches. It parks in the driveway and Claire watches through the fence as Warren Fuhr, played by James Ramar, gets out of the car and heads inside. That dude has been in so many things. Uh, We last talked about him, I believe, on Tales from the Dark Side. Which was episode yeah. six. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! He's yes. Dexter's God. dad. He is. He is Dexter's yeah. dad. He was he's in, Richard Wright in Sex and the City. Of course, he's, he's in that. He's also, or he was also a voice actor on Destiny. There you go. And did yeah. he play two people? two characters? Yeah. <laughs> Chico and Chain. <laughs> yeah, he, he's been busy. Yeah, he's. Oh, in the Warriors. Awesome. He was in the Warriors. Yeah, he's great. He yeah, is. he is. Yeah, and he's great in this. Yes, yeah. he is. The small amount of time he yeah. gets, he gives me one of my favorite moments in the whole film, <laughs> and we'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> when he first comes i'm gonna get alive when we see him from afar uh-huh. i was like is that fucking michael douglas <laughs> and yeah. because of the hair yes oh. i and, was very uh, surprised when it was him yeah and then i was like oh shit i was like it's dexter's dad yeah. like, All right. <laughs> that night over dinner claire tells norman that mary sounded terrified and she thinks that she was afraid of warren Norman asks if she said that specifically, but Claire can only say more or less. She asks Norman if they can walk over there just to see if Mary is all right. But Norman says they're not going to march over to their neighbor's yard and accuse them of anything when they're probably going to keep them up all night again like they did the night before. I want to say that Norman in these stages of the film alternates between logical and reasonable and the exact kind of horror movie spouse we hate yeah yeah and it's very difficult yeah because literally when she's telling him this which is a very real concern Mm -hmm. he's smirking yeah yes i'm like this is so disrespectful (laughs) (laughs) it's unbelievable claire just says that if something were to happen to mary she'd never be able to forgive herself but norman says that nothing is going to happen people argue and fight and it's none of their business claire clears her plate from the table without another word Norman follows her with his own plate, saying that he needs to work tonight. The upcoming conference is the first big preview of his paper, so he tells her that he only needs to stay focused for a little while longer. This is what he's been working for. Claire says that she just wishes Norman could have heard Mary. Norman finally offers that he'll call his friend in the psych department tomorrow and see what he can find out about Warren. Claire makes him promise. See, and that's the reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, all right, I'll look into it. The next day, Claire knocks on the Fjord's front door holding a welcome basket. There's a box outside labeled Mary's Summer Clothes. Claire takes a curious look and continues around the porch, stopping when she sees a woman's shoe with a large drop of maybe blood on it. Unless she's a painter. 
Yeah. We got a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She sets the shoe down on the ledge of the railing instead of back on the porch. I think aside from the main titles, this might be one of the first moments of the score. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really playing a role. Have to call out. It is our old friend, Alan Silvestri. Okay. Death Becomes Her. Yeah, of yeah. course. Countless other things. It's like literally the people he had on his crew for Forrest Gump and Death Becomes Her. Like he loves working with these people, Zemeckis. I love that. Yeah. And so you see so many names overlapping and it's just so cool because they work really well together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But when Claire walks back to her house, Jody, played by Diana Scarwood, is standing on the porch, a.k.a. Christina Crawford from Mommy Dearest. Holy uh, shit. I was very fucking excited. That is, wow. It's yeah. her. I, I will say on site, I was like, this is going to be Claire's cool ass friend. Oh, Just absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Immediately. But that's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. But the two greet each other warmly. Claire, Just imagine her like super blonde. I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, it is her. Yeah. Claire explains that she was trying to give the welcome basket to the neighbors. When Jody praises her, Claire laments that she should have done it weeks ago. But Jody insists that all her neighbors have gotten from her is a bottle of wine that someone else left at her house. <laughs> she says that she just stopped by to see how Claire is doing and looks skeptical when Claire insists that she's fine. Claire asks why it's so hard to believe and Jody reminds her and us that her only daughter that she's extremely close to just <laughs> left for college. See, this is where I said the script. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we were yeah. there. We, we saw were the whole literally thing. there. Yeah. <laughs> On top of that, Jody says that Claire's had a hell of a year with the move, the new house, and the garden. Claire adds in the car, but Jody says that that was just a minor setback. She asks if that was really a year ago, and Claire says that it was this week. Mm hmm. <laughs> Wow. Huh? wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One year ago tonight. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> she finally admits that she is a little tender, and this week her big task is taking pictures of her roses for the garden club. Jody says that she got here just in time and pulls a gift out of her bag kombucha mushroom tea, meant to soothe heartache and promote psychic wellness. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. She says that Floriana suggested that she bring it and Claire bristles at Jody discussing her with her psychic. Jody maintains that Floriana is not a psychic, just a very enlightened spirit like her. She's just trying to help. She's bringing yeah. you the good, good shit. Yeah. <laughs> just drink it. And mushroom say thank tea. you. Yeah. <laughs> say less. <laughs> Claire laughs, saying that means she was gossiping about her then. Jody goes over to the car that she drove up in and sits on the hood, asking Claire if she noticed anything. Claire's excited to see that she bought the car, and Jody says that alimony is a beautiful thing. You lose a husband, you get a car. <laughs> she hugs Claire, telling her to take care, and Claire thanks her for the tea. That night, Claire sits at her state of the art computer, <laughs> playing solitaire as a storm rages behind her outside. Well, what you're not going to do is talk, <laughs> <laughs> talk shit about the contemporary technology. Uh, was, at the was time. The art. Uh, it was yeah. at the time. There was a tone. <laughs> yeah. That's all we had, damn it. I was there. Yeah, we had the, probably the same. <laughs> <laughs> probably not as good. Yeah, it's true. That is true. The power goes out abruptly and Claire goes over to close the window in their bedroom. When she does, something at the Fjord's house catches her eye. It's Warren hastily loading something into the trunk of his car in the rain. Now, that computer is going to be mad it wasn't turned off right. And uh, <laughs> how unlucky is that? It's perfect cover. It's dark. It's, it's storming, raining. Yeah. And your neighbor just happens to look out the window <laughs> and see you doing some shit. It was funny to me. It's like literally the front of his house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he has a lot of shit in the front of his house in this movie <laughs> that he shouldn't be doing. Uh, I I was just shocked at how quickly that escalated. Yeah. yeah. We go from solitaire to a solid scare. And, <laughs> Very uh, good. <laughs> I was just, I think whenever you think about this movie and what comes next, this is never <laughs> really well, explained. It is. What he was doing? Yeah. Oh, well, wait, wait, wait. No, yeah, we'll right. get there. We'll right. get there. Uh, well, that's <laughs> funny. Yeah, but hold on, though. Does that really explain? Hold on, hold well, on, hold uh, on. Why was it shaped like yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my only question. That, yeah. yeah. That. Everything will be explained. Um, Maybe not everything. <laughs> most things will be explained. Adequately. 
most things will be explained. <laughs> but she wakes up Norman, telling him that he needs to see what's going on. He rushes to the window, but when they look out together, both Warren and the car are gone. <laughs> <laughs> She tells him that she thought she saw something and he's very annoyed with her as he goes back to bed. I would be like, Mr. Fjord was loading something that looked like a fucking body into yeah. his trunk. She's just like, oh, I thought I saw something. Yeah. See, this yeah. again, we always say communication. Mm. Explain. Just say. Yeah. I thought I saw something. No, you fucking saw you it. Saw no, something yeah. <laughs> loading a corpse. You saw something very specific. Yeah. <laughs> very terrifying and specific. <laughs> The next morning, Claire peeks over the fence at the Fjord house. As she climbs back down, she slices her arm on a thorn. When she heads back to her own house and reaches out to open the front door, it opens for her. She closes it firmly behind her and cautiously walks around, distracted by the sound of whispering, but she identifies it as wind coming in through an open window in Norman's office. So nothing out of the ordinary? It's fine. Yeah. Nothing supernatural? Right. Doors open sometimes. Yeah. Wind is windy. It's a yeah. Breeze. Well, the heavy, windows are open. Heavy yeah. front I mean, doors open on their own all the time. Yeah. No, well, they're rich as hell. They could be one of those <laughs> yeah, no shit. self-opening doors. <laughs> <laughs> Something, I don't know. Let them. That's fine. She closes the window, accidentally knocking over a framed photo on his desk. She picks the photo back up carefully and the glass is intact, showing a photo of Claire standing next to Norman as he is honored with an award. When Claire leaves the office and goes back into the foyer, the front door is open again. She checks the knob and closes it again, pushing it several times to make sure it stays in place. But I feel like there was a little hesitance on the part of the door when she was trying to close it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, the door hesitated? Yeah, yeah I was like, wait. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I just want to be open. But the thing was is that that's, that's a problem that can be fixed. That's not anything weird yeah right so again at this point we're all feeling very good right yeah all yeah. right sure it'll remain except for like the whole neighbor thing <laughs> well that's bad <laughs> yeah well, she thought she saw something and we don't have to get yeah. into detail or anything not at all that evening claire tries to call caitlin as she walks out on the dock but caitlin's not around is that the last time in the film this happens i think so <laughs> That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Like, that's nuts. And for her to <laughs> say very expositorily, if that's a term, to her friend, mm -hmm. my daughter, who I'm the closest to on the planet Earth. Yeah. Yeah. But in Claire's defense, she gets quite busy. She does. <laughs> but you want to know something? If I'm going through some shit, I am, I'm texting, or well, it's 2000. Yeah. But yeah. I'm, Calling. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody I deem to be close to me. Yeah. Right. But. But she leaves a message with Beatrice to just tell Caitlin that she called. She walks to the end of the dock in sight of Cooper's ball bobbing in the water. But Cooper stops. She asks what's wrong with him because it's not like him to not jump in after the ball. But he stays put growling. She grabs a tool to bring the ball back over to them. When animals start acting the way in a yeah. way that they don't normally act. Mm -hmm. She probably not just be like, what? Cooper, what the fuck? Like, what's wrong with you, dude? Yeah. Is this because I said we didn't have any kids anymore? <laughs> I'm sorry. He's and like, if, and you're fucking calling her again. Cool. Great. <laughs> and if he doesn't normally act like this, that's all you need to see. Yes. Yeah. Plus the door. I mean, come on. You know what I mean? I know there was a draft, but still. <laughs> but it, but We're putting it yeah, together. It's yeah. like, oh, no. I will say I've never had a dog in my life. Right. But I've seen plenty of horror films. Yeah. That's all we need. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. I don't understand why this is where we and go he's from And he's growling. Yeah, that, see, he didn't just stop. No. He's like, fuck that place yeah. right there. So what's going on? She freezes when she sees something in the water next to the ball. It looks like a woman floating beneath the water. Claire stares at it until it disappears. And the phone rings, scaring the shit out of her. <laughs> and Cooper takes the fuck yeah. off. Oh, he <laughs> bounced. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, nope. It's like, I told you. Yeah, I stopped here. You guys can Why stay here. Why did you go all the way down there? Yeah. <laughs> and I will say there was enough murk in the water that... Mm, maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. Yeah. yeah. Last night was much more clear, and you're not sure about that, so... Yeah, yes. When she answers the phone, it's Norman telling her that he's going to be working late. He says, unless she wanted him to come home, but she assures him that it's fine. She stares out into the water until he calls her name, bringing her attention back. She only tells him to take his time and gets off the phone. Why would you tell him no? You're clearly spooked. 
So the, the dog fucking left you. You know what I mean? He's like, oh, no. Cooper's no. Yeah. You, you wanted to be alone so bad. Yeah. Um, no, I don't get it either. Yeah, just be like, yes, I need you home now. Yeah. Something's wrong or whatever. Come home. I'm scared. Yeah. 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 And he was mildly receptive to the things that she said before. I said mildly because yeah. last night he was pretty pissed off. Yeah. He was mad. <laughs> he was asleep, though. That's true. We're all a little grumpy when we're... Right. Yeah. But that night, in the midst of a James Wan fog... <laughs> Claire stands on the porch calling out for Cooper, which made me laugh. <laughs> Cooper said, fuck yeah. this. Cooper oh, no. caught a greyhound. He's fucking, <laughs> he's out of here, dude. Um, <laughs> I I don't know why, but I feel like there. this is, again, a perfect opportunity. You didn't get in touch with your daughter. Mm-hmm. Let's try again. It's the evening. Yeah. yeah. She's probably there. Yeah. But when Cooper doesn't come to her, she tells him to have it his way and reaches for the front door to head back inside. But as she reaches for it, the door opens by itself. I appreciate you, house. <laughs> but let me do this on my own. You know what I mean? This is one of those things You're I want to do. Yeah, you don't. I, I, it's nice. Very, do it. Yeah. very welcoming. I like I like turning the doorknob. Yes. You don't, you don't got to do it all the time. I will say. <laughs> you don't got to do it all the time. <laughs> Not all the time. She hasn't fixed the door yet. This is only scarier because it does look like Insidious outside. Yeah. It does. If it was yeah. still the daytime, this would be just like earlier. Yeah. So again, still no supernatural. <laughs> she pauses before slowly pushing it open and closing it firmly behind her. She hears the low whispering again, but is startled when the radio turns on, blaring static at full blast. Okay, now it's supernatural. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just as abruptly as it turns on, it turns off. Yeah, we're, we were good. <laughs> <laughs> we crossed the line. Yeah, let's leave now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Claire goes to the lab where PhD student number one, played by Dennis and Samaru, presents a halothane solution. Hmm. I'm sure that this means nothing Mm -hmm. but let's pay attention just in case Hmm. (laughs) phd student number two played by jennifer tong asks if halothane is a sedative student one says that it's a dissociative agent it paralyzes motor functions while still leaving you conscious you know what's happening but you can't move sounds terrifying yeah oh yeah Student one holds a rat as Teddy, played by Elliot Goretzky, puts the halothane solution on a cotton ball. He tells Claire hello as he presents it to the rat. They continue talking about the solution, saying that it lasts three to five minutes. Hmm. Three to five minutes. Yeah. Three to five minutes. And it can be used on any mammal when you need to do a procedure and you need them to be immobile and pain free. Any mammal. Any, yeah. any mammal. <laughs> Anyone any mammal. you can think of, it'll work. Cool. Like yeah. a sperm whale? Sure. Sure. They're mammals, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, 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 got, <laughs> I don't think that'll come up. <laughs> no, probably not. We'll see. We'll see. There's yeah. a lot of water in this film. Oh, yeah. There hey, is there a lot of water. So, I mean, hey, fingers crossed. <laughs> I've Fins, watched the film. Yeah. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> Norma comes in and asks what she's doing here and if she's okay. Claire admits that she heard noises at the house and got scared. But when Norman asks if she called the police, she says no. Am I the only one that expected him not to be there when she got there? I forgot about this. So I was like, he's not going to be there when oh, she well, shows up. Oh, the fact that oh. he's like, I got to work tonight. I got to work tonight. Hey, I'm going to be late. I got to work tonight. Yeah. I, it kind yeah. of, yeah. Like they're putting it in your head. Yeah. But he's like, I'm but working. He was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was. I told you I have to work late. This paper is very important. Yeah. <laughs> Back at home, Norman tells her that he's going to have the police check up on the house when he's not home. Claire sarcastically mimics him asking the police to check up on her because she's hearing voices. She mutters, wait till that gets around. He reminds her that he's going to New Haven for the conference and he just wants her to be safe. She says that she's sure it's nothing, though. She asks Norman if he made the call about the Fjords and Norman reports that he was told Warren is harmless. He wouldn't hurt a flea. Claire asks about Mary, but Norman changes the subject. He's like, they told me, uh... I met with Shumway today. I'm like, who the fuck is Shumway? Like, we don't care. I asked you about Mary Fjord. Yeah, we weren't talking about Shumway. I'd be mad. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing is that he was, again, he was doing so well. Yeah. yeah. And then he's like, uh, oh, yeah, my life. Here's so, the like, deal. It either, it either looks sketchy or it looks like you don't really give a fuck. Yeah. You know? 
But he says that he met Shumway, who wrote a book that he loves. Norman says that the man looked right at him when they were introduced and congratulated him on Spencer's theorem. Claire is shocked by this, asking if Shumway really didn't know that Norman's father is dead. But Norman solemnly says that he did know. Claire starts laughing, saying that he's so sensitive about this and he always overreacts. With the smirk, Norman says, he'll have to watch that then, won't he? And he says it's scary. Yeah, he does. I yeah. was a little... <laughs> I, was, I was like, are you going to murder Shumway? I was, I was scared. I Look, this entire section confounded me it's confusing yeah. because and i think that's the thing is that there is so much emphasis in certain scenes put on his relationship with his father yeah but we don't really get enough is it just a matter of him living in his shadow yeah i wonder if it was more fleshed out and then like stuff about his father got cut and now we're left with like random pieces of it because that's kind of what it feels like because he was like upset and yeah. he was like <laughs> Norman Dude. like I was like why are you laughing at him his dad is dead when she, <laughs> like it was when, weird when she started laughing I felt my hand cover my <laughs> mouth because I'm like are you fucking yeah, serious yeah. it was very weird I was a little confused yeah. I was like so does he not like being called his dad's name or did he not I don't, I don't I was like what I don't I, I don't I don't know and I don't know they're in two different fields yeah I think that it's just it's not not fleshed out enough but she shouldn't have laughed she no. shouldn't have laughed but claire asks again about mrs fior asking if her name is mary norman opens the window and just confirms that her name is mary before kissing claire on the head and going to his office to work i laughed so hard he's like hey bye yeah <laughs> i'm done talking about this <laughs> he pulled an einstein yeah <laughs> i did <laughs> The next morning, Claire comes downstairs with the laundry basket to find the front door open. Annoyed, she sets the basket down and closes the door hard. But behind her, the framed photo falls off of Norman's desk and the glass shatters on the floor. Okay, I'm starting to accept that the door may also be supernatural. Yeah. yeah. Claire picks it up and dumps the broken glass into a trash can, but takes a moment to look at the picture inside. She reads the caption, Dr. Norman Spencer being awarded the Distinguished DuPont Chair in Genetics. She sets the photo without its glass back up on the desk and stares out the window as Warren Fuhr's car pulls out of the driveway and disappears. I do want to say I saw in the corner of the photo it had a photographer's name. Uh -huh. And on commentary, they said that that was the name of the prop master. Uh oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> But we cut to Claire eyeing a car parked in a shed on the Fjord's property before approaching the front door again, this time with the basket of flowers and wine. There's a deep tire mark next to the walkway in the grass. She looks around, peeking into the windows where there are plastic sheets laid out on the floor. The shoe with the supposed blood stain mm -hmm. is still on the ledge where she left it. She looks in through the window again to see a game of solitaire laid out on a small table, but the chair next to it is overturned. Claire makes her way back around to the front of the house and gasps when she sees that Warren's car is back. She quietly sets the basket down next to the front door and tries to sneak away. With her back turned, though, Warren suddenly appears in the doorway asking if he can help her. She chuckles and tries to be casual, introducing herself. Warren shakes her hand and she continues that she wanted to stop by and welcome them. He thanks her, but says that this isn't a good time because he's running late. Claire asks if his wife is home and he says that she's not. She presses her luck, asking when <laughs> she'll be back, but he just repeats that he really needs to get going. Claire shakes his hand again before turning back toward her house. She stops and sidesteps the tire mark on her way off of the property. I'm going to be honest. This interaction. Yeah. I don't feel anything negative. I, I gave an ocular pat down. I don't think that he's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that he just murdered his wife in cold blood. <laughs> No, but the, those guys usually don't seem like they murdered their wife in cold blood. <laughs> A lot of them do. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he was a little rude. He was a little brusque. I think that's what it was because it, it took him a second when he when she asked about the wife and he was just like, no. Yeah. Like, 
Well, what does that mean? Well, when is she coming back? I have to go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm running late. I told but you that. That is something that someone would say if they were having marital trouble. No, yeah, true. That, yeah. They don't want to talk about it. Yeah. yeah, and you're standing in my way. I have to get to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've already told you I'm yes. late. Nice to meet you. Thank you for the basket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not necessarily suspicious, but he was a little bit rude. Yeah. He was a little just curt. Yeah. Cobain. <laughs> but that night, she talks on the phone with Jody, reporting that Warren is eating a TV dinner alone. She is watching Warren with her binoculars. More this, is window. A, this is a lot. Yeah. This is a lot. She looks through his window where he sits eating. The doorbell rings on Jody's end and she starts to end her call. Claire looks through another window, but when she looks back at where Warren was, he's gone. <laughs> Jody tells Claire to call her back if Warren starts eating a serial killer dessert like Ladyfingers and they get off the phone. She's fun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Claire checks from window to window looking for Warren, asking out loud where he went. She goes to another window and finds Warren on the front porch. He picks up the basket that she left there, tossing the flowers <laughs> over the railing <laughs> and taking the bottle of wine that she had tucked inside for them. He then throws the basket on the porch before going back inside. It made me laugh because he did not care. She no. can, we can see your house. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Why would you go to the front of your house? To disrespect this basket. I just don't get it. Not only that, when I go to my car in the morning, I'm going to see those flowers yeah, on the yeah. I put those there. <laughs> those are my flowers. But Claire cycles through the windows again before setting eyes on Warren, standing in the window and looking out toward her. That's why he did it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know you're watching. Yeah, yeah, why are you fucking watching me? Get a life. <laughs> I did have a question. I don't know that you could see. The, she's in the dark in her house. He's not necessarily looking at her Just but he her is direction? looking out the window okay. yeah. yeah okay because she does well she does continue. i would have been scared too. <laughs> <laughs> no you're right but i think you can probably because i used to have some when i was younger they uh -huh. were like military grade ones oh shit and they had a like reflection thing for like the sun to help see i guess like to bounce the light off at night okay whatever little light there is but you could see those motherfuckers reflecting. Oh. Like, you could see the light on it. <laughs> like, is someone watching me? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Never mind. Because I would have them, and they'd be sitting there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then, like, I would see a tiny reflection on them, and I'm like, what the? F oh, it's a fucking binoculars. Like, that shit looks scary. <laughs> well, yeah, Just, dude. <laughs> Just two the, circles yeah. somewhere. It's like, what is that? It's like Bly Manor. You remember the? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking like um, what surprised me about her was that she kind of thought she had been caught. Yeah. yeah. And then she's like, let's try a uh, window number two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. But when she peeks back up, he's gone. She stands <laughs> in another window <laughs> looking for him again. <laughs> she finds his front door open. The dog begins to bark as Claire scans Warren's porch and car, but she doesn't find him anywhere. Cooper stands at the end of the driveway, barking his head off, and Claire notices footprints deep in the grass next to him. The footsteps turn into muddy footprints on her stone driveway. So this, for me, her reaction time is so slow. Yeah. Because all I'm thinking is the faulty haunted door. Yeah. Yeah. But somebody's in somebody's in the house she's right she's like yeah. huh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not good <laughs> but if you're down there whoa. <laughs> <laughs> she turns to walk away from the window and runs straight into norman who snatches her binoculars and asks what the hell she's doing <laughs> it looks pretty bad i mean <laughs> it's not a good look no <laughs> she says that she was looking and he corrects her spying she confesses that she was spying on Warren, but Norman just wants to know why she's not ready for dinner with Stan. Claire has completely forgotten that it was tonight and promises that she'll only be fashionably five minutes late as she runs to the bathroom to get ready. He really um, is very accepting of her. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd be, I'm not going to lie. I'd be kind of annoyed. I'd be like, you, were you really sitting at the window looking just, at this motherfucker? I feel like it's spying. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> What are you doing? You got out the binoculars. Cool. Yeah, that, no, you knew what you were doing. I have well. to admit, ever since I was a kid, I thought that fashionably five minutes late thing was like the coolest thing I'd ever heard. I'm just late when I yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. when I show up late. It doesn't matter, but she's cool. But in the car on the way to the restaurant, Norman asks if she thinks that Warren murdered his wife. 
Claire presents the facts that Mary was terrified and her car is sitting in their garage. Norman proposes that maybe she was out or had the flu or got abducted by aliens. <laughs> He tries to call the restaurant to let them know that they're running late, but Claire reminds him that they don't get any signal until they're in the middle of the bridge. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sure that's not going to come to play yeah. later. Norman says that he knows they're not, but the call does go through. Claire remarks that that's a relief. When they arrive at the restaurant, Claire greets Dr. Stan Powell, played by Ray Baker, with a kiss and takes responsibility for being late. Stan assures her that they only just got there themselves. But when Claire asks where the new squeeze is, Elena, played by Wendy Crewson, walks up. She and Claire immediately recognize each other and are thrilled. They hug each other tightly and explain that they know each other before hugging again. So is it a good thing or a bad thing? Like, I, Are we going to get drunk and you're going to act a fool? Or are we, <laughs> like, or, what are we in store out? for? What's, what's happening? I, I was more caught off guard by her like 1950s style of speech. I don't know if you heard what she <laughs> said to Norman. Like she's so transfixed on Claire, on Claire, but then she goes, "Oh Norman, how do you do?" <laughs> <laughs> it's like what? This is very Hitchcock. Yeah. <laughs> it's so old fashioned. It's like people say that still. She went back to another time. Yeah. <laughs> but we cut to them sitting at the table. Claire and Elena speaking across the table at each other, and Norman and Stan speaking across the table at each other. Claire feels they should have just sat across from who they were going to be speaking to because yeah. they're like. <laughs> diagonally speaking mm. to each other i have to say though i think this is one of the most interesting double dialogue scenes i've ever seen in my life yeah because yeah. they're both just going yeah. yes they said on commentary that they really were mindful they treated it like a dance the conversation mm. so that each actor who needed to say an important line would be you heard hear. okay it's okay. very well done yeah Claire fills Elena in on having just dropped Caitlin off at college and Stan spills the tea on a cardiologist they know getting fired for stalking an intern. They seem oddly sympathetic towards the stalker. Well, they're like, well, it we was can't, a little weird. Can't yeah. get away with that anymore. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? Oh God. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's pretty gross. He looked over at his wife. He's like, mm. <laughs> 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 See, they don't forgive yeah. they don't forgive peepers anymore. It's like you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Norman remarks that they don't screw around with that shit anymore. Elena and Claire figure out that the last time they got together was in New York after Michael died. And when Stan asks who Michael is, Norman tells him that Michael Marlov was Claire's first husband. And I thought this was gonna come into play more, but it doesn't. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't get why it's it's very interesting. Yeah. You saw the photo albums. Yeah. yeah. You think it's going to become this huge thing. Yeah. But they go on that Michael was a musician and Elena says that they all toured together. When Stan admits that he's never heard Claire play, Elena tells him that she would sit on stage during Claire's solos and have tears streaming down her face. Stan asks why she stopped playing, and Claire says that one night after a concert, she met a handsome genius scientist, and she was married three months later. The two kiss, and Elena asks if that's when they were in Vermont. They correct her that they were in Boston until Norman was offered a position, which Stan supplies was the DuPont chair in genetics. Elena asks if Norman is teaching at his father's school, which I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mention his dad. Yeah. But Norman says that he doesn't teach much anymore. He's currently running a project. It gets quiet and Claire says that Norman's father had an old stuffy house on the lake and that's where they are now after they practically gutted it. Stan tells her that the house is beautiful and Claire agrees, but Norman chimes in that the house is haunted and Claire is hearing things. I was mad that he said that. It yeah. really felt like he was trying to take her down a peg. Yeah. Because they were like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah with your dad. No, I'm running a project. But fucking Claire. She's like <laughs> yeah. hearing voices. I was like, you didn't have to do her like that. No. Like, for real. Yeah, everything was fine. It was like, get this bitch thinks it's haunted. <laughs> yeah. I, was I like, couldn't believe that. Whoa. Dude. I would have been mad. But clearly embarrassed, Claire answers their follow-up questions, admitting that she heard voices and whispers and a picture even fell. Elena assures her that she believes in all of that, and Stan asks Claire who she thinks it is. But Norman says he knows. It's his dad, pissed off about all the renovations. Stan and Norman laugh, and Claire chuckles good-naturedly. There's a very odd... <laughs> 
like shot i of, know who it is well, yeah. <laughs> when he says that it's scary and yeah. then he's like it's my old man yeah but <laughs> Everybody arrives at that joke at separate times. Well, because yeah. it was like, are we like, allowed to laugh at this? Yeah. You're scaring me, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Your vibe is Wait, all the way serious? off. Are you, uh, yeah, is that real? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that night, Claire replaces the glass on the picture frame. On her way out of the office, she steps on a forgotten piece of glass. She pulls it out of her foot and inspects it under the lamp. Her attention is drawn to the vent on the floor where something is revealed to be inside when she shines the lamp over it. She uses a letter opener to pull out a key. She tries the key on Norman's desk drawer, but it doesn't work. Upstairs, Claire pauses when she sees steam billowing from the bathroom and into the hallway. (laughs) Sorry, I think you're clearly being led somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, I I understand that Norman's kind of making you feel like this isn't real or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But this is kind of indisputable. Yeah. Yeah. She slowly pushes open the bathroom door and walks into the steamy bathroom. The bathtub is filled to the absolute brim with water. Why is it scarier? It is full. Like that there's is, yeah. not oh, one no, more yeah. drop of water can fit in there. I learned about displacement in science class and I believe seventh grade. And mm-hmm. th- you couldn't put a body in there. You couldn't no. get in there. So no, you it's never gonna do go that. all over the floor. Yeah. Displacement. <laughs> <laughs> Claire reaches inside and pulls the plug. But when she turns, next to her own reflection in the water is one of a blonde woman, wet and haggard, standing next to her. That's it. She screams and Norman comes running. He hugs her, assuring her that it's okay as she watches the last of the water drain out of the tub. So I did want to talk about an interview that I saw on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I was very shocked. I was looking up stuff, trying to figure out background on this film and I saw an interview that Michelle Pfeiffer had with Drew Barrymore. All right. <gasps> and in the interview, Michelle Pfeiffer tells Drew Barrymore that her performance in this film of her being afraid and scared at any point in the film is 100% her copying Drew Barrymore's performance in Scream. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. And she was like so overjoyed to hear it. It's <laughs> interesting because Drew Barrymore took a picture of Michelle Pfeiffer to wardrobe and that was her idea for her wig for scream i was thinking the hair yeah yeah Yeah, it does it does so it's kind of i love that but but i thought that was awesome but we immediately cut to claire sitting in an office across from dr drayton played by joe morton they sit in silence until dr drayton asks whose idea it was for claire to come see him She tries to say that it was both of their idea before admitting that she didn't really want to come here, but she did because Norman is worried about her. She jokes that he probably wishes the doctor would just pump her full of prescriptions so he can live his life in peace. But when he asks if she really thinks that, she says no. He asks if she's currently on medication and she says no, but then says she takes Valium to help her sleep. She has trouble sleeping when she's anxious. Dr. Drayton asks if she only gets anxious at night, and she says no, but she does only take the volume at night. <laughs> I was like, okay. All right. He asks why Norman is worried about her, and she says that she doesn't know, but then she says that ever since Caitlin left for school, but she's unable to finish. She asks why this is so hard, and Dr. Drayton offers her a fireball, <laughs> which is sweet, but like, I don't like that those fireballs are just free balling it in that dish yeah no. that's not good I, I, I don't love that that's the first thing i thought i i thought two things about this i was like first of all why do so many movie therapists have cool basement offices like this yeah they do. <laughs> <laughs> like i love it but then the other thing i was like man a fireball is a really bold snack to assume everybody snack yeah <laughs> well, <laughs> well i guess it's, it's not a snack. Candy yeah. than a snack well that shows how much i know right? it is those <laughs> are hot yeah yeah i haven't had one in a long time they're good but i wouldn't just have them <laughs> no in a bowl you think like more like a mint yeah. or something. Yeah. A peppermint. A peppermint yeah. is very universal. Peppermint is mild. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, you want this hot ass candy? <laughs> <laughs> Burn the shit out of your mouth. <laughs> That'll get you talking. <laughs> it's hot ones. This is hot ones before hot ones, oh, dude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it gets you to admit shit that you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But she places the candy in her mouth and Dr. Drayton explains that it's so hard because he's a stranger and she's talking about personal things. He says that most people worry on their first visit if he thinks they're crazy, but he assures her that he has to have at least three sessions with someone before he can commit. Uh. Claire pauses at this, but he tells her that it was just a joke. (laughs) 
She chuckles a little, then takes the fireball out of her mouth, remarking that it's good. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are, but that was so funny. <laughs> her pivot, though, is... Then she yeah. drops the bomb. There's a ghost in my house. The fireball gets him every time. <laughs> See, There's you. a reason he has them. Dr. Drayton says nothing. So Claire continues that she saw the woman in the bathtub next to her. When he asks what she looks like, Claire describes her as looking like her. Only she had green eyes. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. How did I'm you see that? Terribly sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes such an interesting point. Yeah. And it comes up in the movie a lot, but there is no way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought the same thing. I was like, eh. come on. <laughs> You're lucky to be able to tell that she was blonde. Yes. Yeah. And even that, I'm like, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Maybe she wasn't. Maybe she wasn't. <laughs> Dr. Drayton asks if she has any idea who the woman is. And Claire says that she might, but she doesn't want to say yet. He accepts this. And when she asks his advice, he tells her to try to communicate with her and find out what she wants. She sarcastically asks if he wants her to go out and buy a Ouija board. I am surprised that the therapist is... Encouraging? Yeah. Yeah, I... <sighs> Look, this man's responsible for Skynet. We understand <laughs> you're not trying to help me now. Why would you encourage me to do that? Suspicious. Sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> Buy a Ouija board. Open some doors. Why do you want me to do that? I don't wait, wait, trust on, you. Yeah. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> not Skynet. <laughs> we cut to Claire ripping the plastic off of a Ouija board. Hmm. She and Jody sit on the bathroom floor with wine and a candle between them. Jody asks if they're in the bathroom so the ghost can use the potty, but Claire says they're here because that's where she saw her. Jody advises her that they're supposed to sit in a protective circle, but when Claire places Mary Fuhr's bloodstained shoe in between them, she's distracted. So are you guys yes or no on the seance? Because absolutely, I'm there. Yeah, I'm I'm there. The thing me and John Paul had talked about this too. We were just a little thought it was strange that jody is like laughing and stuff yeah because well, the way that she is like oh like she's a uh, um, spiritual yeah, yeah yeah um the shit that jody subscribes to i subscribe to uh -huh. and i would not be giggling and laughing i wouldn't be like oh the ghost needs to pee like i'd be like yeah. okay i'm not fucking around we need to be very like honestly I, I felt like more the way that jody was introduced that jody would kind of be holding her hand through this that's what i want and that's why she called her you know what i mean i think the character that we were introduced to this is a little off the dynamics of the scene would work better, I think. Yeah. yeah. Because even if, what if it was that she just told Jody that what the doctor had said or whatever, and Jody's like, no, seriously. Or Jody yeah, yeah. comes over with and the Ouija then, Exactly. Yeah. And Claire's She's like, trying to convince her to. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. That makes Claire's a lot like, more oh, sense. oh, I feel silly or whatever. And Jody's like, no, no. like, you know, I don't. Yeah. yeah, no, you guys are right. Yeah. Claire will not answer where the shoe came from. So Jody accuses her of stealing it. Claire uses the excuse that they needed something of the dead woman, and she demands that they just start. They both place their fingers on the planchette and Claire calls out that they wish to commune with the spirit, but her words just make Jody laugh. Claire admits that this is all ridiculous, but Jody tries to assure her. She asks the woman's name and Claire tells her and she chants Mary Fuhr, Mary Fuhr. See, you're right. It's, yeah. It's too playful. Claire gives it another try, this time telling the spirit that they wish to communicate. When nothing happens, Jody begins to laugh again, but Claire shushes her. After a moment of silence, the flame on the candle begins to flicker, drawing both of their attention. This even shuts Jody up, <laughs> and when they both slowly pull their fingers away from the planchette, it moves abruptly. The candle flame dwindles until it goes out completely, and the door to the bathroom slowly begins to creak open. Claire and Jody stare at the door and scream when another door next to Claire slams open. So there's two ways of entry into this bathroom, which is important. Yes. I didn't know that until right now. No, and it becomes one of my favorite sequences. Yeah. Yeah. But what comes through the door isn't a ghost or a spirit. It's Cooper. Dog knows how to make an entrance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did he do the candle too? Is that yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, nah. Uh, gotcha. He's the dog from Goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Later, as Jody leaves, Claire asks her to keep their seance between the two of them. Norman doesn't need to know because ever since the accident, he treats her like she's fragile and loopy. But she does admit that she is seeing ghosts in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> 
Jody reminds her that she wrapped her car around a tree going 80 miles per hour. Norman was shaken up. All of them were. Claire says again that the accident was a year ago and she's fine. Jody agrees and hugs her, adding in that she's not much of a medium, though. Jody gets in her sweet new car and leaves. I do think it's interesting how they're kind of drip feeding us uh, things about this accident. Yeah. yeah. You got the stuff in the scrapbook now. And we'll eventually. Yeah. yeah. But Claire closes the door and heads back upstairs. Through the hallway mirror, we can see that the computer has turned itself on. That's alarming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she puts away the seance paraphernalia and closes the bathroom door before hiding the Ouija board away in a drawer. But when she comes back into the hallway by the secondary door to the bathroom, steam seeps out from the door and into the hallway. Claire opens the door and the bathroom that she was just in is now once again filled with steam and the bathtub is again filled to the brim with water. This is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michelle Pfeiffer said in an interview that um, as soon as she leaves, it's all one shot. Yeah. Yeah. Which only makes it even better. But as soon as she comes around, like outside of the first door, she just hears a cacophonous noise of all these crew members working and trying to get it all filled and steamy and scary and everything. But because there's no cut, this is one of the most successful, like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. Moments in the whole film for me. Yeah, it's it's great. Yeah. Because you just saw her in here. Yeah, she was messing with the curtain. Yeah. Yeah. And you wanted to make contact. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, you did. Now. You should open the door. Yeah. Well, there, you know, even businesses are only open certain hours. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's like, but it's it's nighttime yeah, now. It's all James Wan outside. <laughs> <laughs> but she stares at the tub in disbelief. But then there's a whisper and movement in the mirror next to her. She wipes some of the steam from the mirror and makes her way to the bathtub. John Paul pointed out to me we were rewatching it this morning. You see that woman step away, her reflection step away as Claire steps up to it. Oh, shit. I never noticed it before. No, me neither. Yeah, on my uh, second rewatch, I was like, I was like, oh, shit. I was like, she's (laughs) right there. Because you're looking at her. Yeah. She comes up and the other woman steps back out of the view. It's creepy. That's a lot. But she asks, what do you want? And the words, you know, appear in the steam of the mirror. No, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. That was the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So I was asking you. Uh, I feel like, but then again, that's why text, you can read any kind of emotion into it because it could be coy. It could be like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Still, no, I don't. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm the same level of scared. No oh, matter okay. what that is. Fair, enough, fair you've, enough. You've seen me trying to figure this out. You yeah. know, I don't know. You know that yeah, I'm you're... clueless. You that know is... that I know that you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's pissing me off. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just telling me. But Claire runs downstairs, and this is when she notices the computer. Her solitaire game is pulled up with the screen for her to enter her initials into the winner's circle. So the implication (laughs) of the ghost winning solitaire (laughs) 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 to be able to give this clue is... um, (laughs) That is top shelf. Wow, I did turn on the computer earlier. It's like, fuck, I got to do this quick. (laughs) Yes, yes. But the initials M-E-F appear again and again and again. I, okay, look, this is horrifying. Yeah. yeah. Right? Even with the game winning, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> implication. <laughs> but seeing on the computer just meh, 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 that was very funny to yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't get like, past that. Hello, I'm yeah. It's yeah. M-E-F. But <laughs> I'm sorry if, look, you can write, <laughs> you can write on mirrors. Yeah. Write your whole fucking name. You don't have to go oh, play yeah. a game of solitaire. I only have a certain amount of power. <laughs> <laughs> I used it all up on I on, on you, you know. know. <laughs> <laughs> but Claire surprises Norman again at his office in the lab. She tearfully tells him she's dead. He's like, <laughs> who? Oh, the Fjord thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's been solved though, right? No. No. Oh, wait, we're not there yet. No. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I, I, I'm on the wrong page of my yeah. notes. <laughs> it's been a long fucking morning, I'm sorry. But crying, she admits that she and Jody had a seance in the bathroom and nothing happened. But when she went back, she was there. Norman is taken aback that she had a seance. He asks if she's angry with him because she knows how important this paper is and how much it means. He can't help but feel like she's trying to sabotage him. 
I don't think that's fair. I yeah. was like, Norman. Yeah, I'm like, dude, are you no. sure? No. <laughs> but she tells him this isn't about him. Something is happening to her and it's not for spite or attention. She tells him that something is happening in their house, whether he likes it or not. Outside, she runs away from him, but he makes her stop. He tells her that she's overreacting and to lower her voice, but she denies both of these things. She tells him that she might be losing her mind, but what if she isn't? Her voice raises again, and Norman asks if they can just not do this here. They look through the window at a group of people walking in one direction, but walking against them the opposite way is Warren Fjord. <laughs> Claire marches inside with Norman trailing behind her. How did she break, break away from him? <laughs> yeah. She has to go She's past She's determined. Him to- <laughs> she pushes Warren from behind. She tells him that he thinks he's pretty smart and he got away with it, but she knows. She loudly tells him, I know you killed her, you murdering son of a bitch. This, of course, <laughs> makes everyone stop in their tracks. Warren asks who, and she says his wife. Norman tries to excuse her behavior. He's like, she's very upset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, clearly. I mean. But it all comes to a screeching halt when out of the bathroom steps Mary Fuhr. She goes over to her husband who puts an arm around her, asserting that he didn't kill his wife. He is calm and gracious, even asking Claire if she's all right. <laughs> she's like, I was talking to the guy behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch or whatever. I, I just, I, I don't think... I would I could be more embarrassed. Yeah. Oh, it's I know. humiliating. This entire room. But but in all fairness, she the way she tells him when they're in the office, he should have been like he should have believed her. He should have been he like, should've... okay, okay. Is this about me? Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> uh, nobody's sabotaging you. No. And she's no. even telling you, look, dude, something's happening. Fuck everything else. Listen to what I'm telling you. And I'm sure. I mean, we don't see it, but I'm sure he's like, oh, whatever. Yeah. And then, of course, so now she's like, okay, you don't believe me? I'm going to, you know what I mean? Go confront this dude on my own. Now yeah. I've made a fool of both of yes. us. <laughs> yeah. Are you happy, Norman? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say with the pacing of the film, we're about an hour in-ish. Yeah. Um, It's very interesting to me that we had that large of amount of misdirection. Yeah. Yeah. Because this was what I thought this film was going to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Mary's breathing comfortably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Norman whispers at Claire for them to go and apologizes for her. Claire just stands there staring at Warren and Mary. We cut to Claire at Dr. Drayton's office. <laughs> they sit across from each other in silence. Claire's spacing out until Dr. Drayton taps her. She comes back to the room and he asks what happened just now. Claire tells him that she just saw Norman's face and how scared he was for her. He asks how their marriage is, and Claire asserts that it's good. They've had their moments, but Norman is a wonderful husband and father. Sure, he can be obsessed with work, and sometimes it's like he doesn't see her, like there's something wrong with her. Uh, What was that last thing you said? Yeah. Yeah. Tell you what, take another fireball. (laughs) (laughs) And we're going to unpack all of that. Have the bomb. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> get all the truth out uh, that's the one everyone hates yeah we we tried it or he tried it i was too scared <laughs> she was hot <laughs> <laughs> but dr drayton tells her that that can't feel good and she just giggles as she agrees he lets her sit in that and she says that she can see where he's going with this but this is fine she diagnoses herself with an empty nest episode and she just saw things that weren't there and that's what she's willing to deal with Later, when Claire arrives home, she goes to put her key into the lock, but freezes when she sees a gift bag on the porch. The attached card has a man being haunted by a ghost on the front of it. I (laughs) thought it was adorable. (laughs) And the note inside reads, thought you might need this. Love, Jody." Claire reaches into the bag and pulls out a big book, Witchcraft, Ghosts, and Alchemy. See, again, this only lends to what you guys were saying earlier. About yeah. Jody. Yeah. yeah. She's in this world. Yeah. She believes in it. So it was just weird to me that she's like, the body. <laughs> it's like, yeah. what? I would never do that. No. <laughs> As she looks through the book, Mary Fior comes over. She apologizes for scaring Claire because she can see how it must have looked that day. Claire tells her that it's fine, and they warmly, properly introduce themselves. And when Claire offers her a cup of coffee, Mary accepts. Later, they sit together outside drinking coffee. 
Claire tells her that she doesn't think she imagined how upset Mary seemed at the fence that day. Mary agrees that she didn't imagine it. Claire asks her what she was so afraid of. And Mary asks Claire if she's ever been so consumed by a feeling for someone that she couldn't breathe. That the time you're with that person is so passionate that it's physically painful when they leave. Claire's like, uh, sure. (laughs) That was very sad. I know. Yeah. Mary says that she couldn't catch her breath and she panicked. She didn't think that anyone would hear her. She says that she tried to leave Warren. She went to stay with her mother, but Warren brought her things in the middle of a rainstorm and begged her to come home. He wrapped it in a rug and a <laughs> yeah. plastic bag. No, and- shit. That, those are her things. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the quickest way. I'm going to throw everything on the rug and then yes. you fucking roll it out. Well, I know she's at her mother's. She'll want her murder disposal material. Yeah. Yes. She, that she always talks about she Nina. doesn't leave home without it no mary says that claire must think she's pathetic but claire insists that she doesn't so mary's okay right yeah everything's pizza yeah everything's fine yeah okay just making sure because like the the way that she said she's when she said she tried to leave him i was like you tried to leave so something's wrong but no she's just very in love i guess right that she she never wants him to leave i guess that's lovely yeah but I don't know. Yeah. She's like, I love you too much. I'm yeah. going to stay with my mother. Just to see how much I love you. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out it's a lot. But he asked me to come back, so I'm back. Very good. And that's pretty romantic in the rain. Yeah, it is. Warren knew what he was All doing. Right. <laughs> but as Claire and Norman walk into a party that night, he tells her that they only need to stay long enough for someone to approve his budget before they leave for vacation. The person, not Norman and Claire. <laughs> Very good. When she asks Dean Templeton's wife's name, he reminds her that it's Lois. As soon as they walk into the party, they greet both Mr. and Mrs. Phil and Lois Templeton, played by Tom Dahlgren and Sloan Shelton, by name. It took me a second, but I remembered the name, and it's because I wrote it in one of my scripts. Tom Dahlgren was one of the detectives in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, oh cool. okay. <laughs> That's cool. But later, after Claire downs a glass of wine, she walks around the party by herself. She sees <laughs> Warren and Mary standing together talking. When they see her, Mary gives Claire a friendly wave and Warren pantomimes <laughs> strangling his wife. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> but I... He, he laughs and smiles after and shrugs like, ah, huh? like can we laugh about this yeah. now? <laughs> I, I laughed out loud so hard. <laughs> Uh, I was like, you're kind of an asshole, but yeah. that's, that, that's very fucking funny. They said on commentary that this was improv on behalf of James oh, Lamar. And I, whenever I saw that, I was like, let's follow this couple around me. I I like, I like I'm, not, I'm not ready to say goodbye to yeah. them. But Claire abruptly turns away from them and she's like fuming. She, I don't think she thought it was funny. She sees Norman across the room being photographed with two other men. And when he catches her eye, he promises her only five more minutes. She goes to the bar and orders another glass of white wine. She's approached by Lois, who asks how she's doing. She asks after the house renovations and tells Claire that it's nice to see her doing so well. She says she hasn't seen Claire since Norman's reception here last year, and she was worried. Claire is curious as to why Lois would be worried, but Lois dismisses this train of thought as her becoming a nosy old lady. Claire presses, though, but Lois reminds her how upset she got at the DuPont chair party. Claire doesn't remember any of this, but it suddenly comes back to her. She did get upset, and she broke Lois's crystal. Lois tells her that it's fine, it was only a cheap wine glass, but that Claire had gone pale like she'd seen a ghost. Huh. What was that last thing you said? <laughs> <laughs> I um, learned on commentary this scene is uh, the majority of it is one long take. Oh, wow. The camera's like sweeping around everything. That's cool. Yeah. They said it took 26 takes. Damn. And it's, well, you got, I mean, you have the coordination of the background actors. Yeah. It's a ton of stuff. Yeah. You don't have to do that. I think that's the thing is yeah. like they were really going for something. Yeah. yeah. And it works. It does. But back at their house, Claire looks over a photo of Norman at the DuPont chair party from last year. She sets it back down on his desk, but the second she walks away, we hear it slide across the desk and the glass shatter once again on the floor. I know you want to tell me something. <laughs> Can you please stop breaking my shit? Literally. <laughs> like, like, I'll get you a scratch paper and a pen yes. or something. The mirror was great. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. We'll I'll load up, up solitaire again. again. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> please yes. stop. 
stop breaking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other thing I love is that if she's going to type M-E-F over and over and over again, she could have typed anything. No, yeah. she could only use the like, three letters. Oh, is that ghost law or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Claire carefully picks the frame up, but the back comes off. Inside, between the back of the frame and the photo, is a newspaper clipping. The ghost is like, look under the frame, Brad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> In the corner of the clipping is the headline and beginning of an article, Search Intensifies for Missing Girl. Before the rest of the information is lost, Claire reads that the girl's first and middle name are Madison and Elizabeth. M. E. Mm. What's next, my friends? But a research scene. Oh, you love it. Yeah. <laughs> In the Vermont Missing Persons database, Claire finds her name. Madison Elizabeth Frank. She repeats it. M. E. F. We got girl, it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we know. Yes. But she clicks on her name. As the photo slowly loads on the screen, we see that Madison has blonde hair and green eyes. Now, you got lucky with the green <laughs> <Yeah>. eyes. <laughs> <laughs> the picture finally reveals itself to show Madison Elizabeth Frank, played by Amber Valletta, smiling at us. Amber Valletta, if you recall, dead silence. I was All wondering right. where I had seen her from. That's yeah. exactly yeah. who she is. I thought the same thing. I was like, I know I've seen yep. her before. Mm -hmm. I was like, she looks familiar. And then I was like, no, I was like, I, 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 somebody will yeah, tell me. <laughs> yeah, I was like, one of them are going to I'm not even going to look yeah. it up. Well, my job here is done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Claire stares at the photo stunned, zeroing in on the chain of a necklace around Madison's neck while reaching for her own neck. The next morning, Norman comes downstairs. Claire sits in a chair and Norman tries to greet her with a kiss, but she turns her head and it lands on her cheek instead. He asks if she's been up all night and she says yes. He asks if she's okay and she gives a shrug while giving him a stare that clearly indicates that she is not okay. She looks a little unhinged. Like yeah. Claire does not look okay well, when he finds her sitting there. She has come across a lot of information. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean... I don't know. I feel like just because we understand that Mary's okay, that doesn't mean that the haunting's over. Yeah, yeah. Th these that shit still, still happened. happened. Yeah, that that makes it kind of even worse because yeah. it's like, oh, so it's not her. Now what the fuck? Now I'm, who is it? I'm stuck back at the beginning again. Exactly. Yeah. So she hands him a photo of Madison, <laughs> and I'm laughing. <laughs> I made it a point to put printed in color. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big deal for me. Well, we don't normally do that. You're not using that. my yeah. color ink. I'm sorry, Madison. <laughs> but she asks if he remembers this, and he does. She's the girl that disappeared last year. Claire asks if Norman knew her, and he tells her concretely, no. He takes a seat and asks her where all this is going. Claire tells him that Madison is the woman she's been seeing. She's the one Claire saw in the bathtub. She is the ghost. She thought it was Mary, but it wasn't. And this time, she's positive. Norman yells at her to stop. He comes for her, telling her that he knows she's going through something he doesn't understand, and he's tried to be her for her, but this is enough. He offers to call Dr. Drayton to see them together, but Claire says no. He tells her to just tell him what to do, and she only asserts, it's her. I feel like this outburst was very unnecessary. It's weird. Oh, I would yeah. be like, why are you so mad? Yeah. And to tell your wife, it's enough. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> that is bonkers, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Later, as the rain pours outside, Claire speaks to, I guess, an investigator on the phone. Yeah, I don't understand these connections. I don't know how she yeah, has the end to do this. But like, well, I have a plant in this. <laughs> <laughs> in the Vermont PD or whatever. We toured together or whatever. I don't fucking... <laughs> but she asks if anything was ever found, like Madison's car. He tells her that Madison drove a souped up Mustang convertible. And they really just think she's probably in Mexico partying with her friends. So it's just been downgraded to a runaway. Okay, uh, just a couple things. Madison's a grown woman. Yeah, yeah. she's in her 20s. Um, and this it's been like a year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to party in Mexico yeah, for no a fucking shit. year straight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, that seems like a long time. That's though. a lot. But he says that her mother still lives in Addison County. We immediately cut to Claire standing on the Frank's doorstep. Behind the screen inside is Mrs. Frank, played by Nicole Mercurio. 
She introduces herself and says that she wants to talk to her about Madison. Inside, Mrs. Frank gives Claire a cup of coffee and remarks that she looks too old to be a student. Thank that, you, Mrs. Frank. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. Claire confesses that she's not a student. She met Madison at a party. This tracks for Mrs. Frank, who remarks that she doesn't know how a girl that wild was still able to get all A's. She remembered that her daughter loved to read. Sometimes she would lock herself in her room for days and just read. That sounds great. <laughs> they even wanted to put her in a gifted school when she was younger, but she wasn't trying to hear it. Mrs. Frank sums it up that she probably got her smarts from her father's side of the family. Claire remarks that she never mentioned her father, which I thought was a weird thing to say because you've never, <laughs> yeah. you never talked to her. <laughs> but it's exactly what you want to say if you're an investigator. Because to then she'll tell talking. you. Yeah. 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 So I'll let it slide. Well, it works, too, because <laughs> Mrs. Frank explains that when Madison was 12, her father left and she never talked about him ever again. She strokes a cat in her lap as she turns her attention to the muted soap opera on her TV. She tells Claire that you don't even really need the sound because you can tell what's going on by their faces. Sometimes she does turn the sound on to feel like someone's here, though. Then she finally asks Claire, why are you here? Claire admits that she doesn't know. So Mrs. Frank is like, you want to see Madison's room? I do. I do want to see Madison's room, but you got to let me pet that cat first. Yeah. <laughs> he looks Something like more a, important just came yeah. up. Yeah. Real, real, real sweet boy in your arms. I got to pet that cat before I get out of here. <laughs> in Madison's room, Mrs. Frank shows a framed picture of Madison and tells her about the scholarships that she got, including one to Princeton, but she had wanted to stay on the East Coast. That framed picture of her, I was like, we get it. You're gorgeous. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. They, it's a fucking model shot. That's what they had said on commentary. <laughs> yeah. she, she was a model. Yeah. But you can tell. Yeah. I think this was her film debut. Very oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. But she shows the last photos that Madison ever took, including the one that the police used. But she has to excuse herself when the phone begins to ring. Claire inspects the picture and recognizes it as the one that she saw on the website, only this time the full necklace is visible. Next to the pictures is a neatly kept braid, presumably for Madison's first haircut, tied together with a pink bow. And Claire <laughs> reaches toward the braid, the audacity. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I what the fuck? I can't believe this. I gasped because that... Her mother, dude. Yeah. Like, I, know, oh, yeah. I know that they said, and when she's with Jody, it's like, we need something of her. You're in a room full of innocuous shit. Yes. Yeah. She clearly kept her room the same way. You could have taken a pin. Take take the <laughs> like, headshot. Yeah. The oh, yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> no. You could, That's wild. Yeah. There was so much stuff there. I just, I really couldn't believe that. Yeah. I, especially a little later. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> But we cut to Claire in her bathroom, lighting a candle and looking at herself in the mirror as Norman pulls up to the house. Claire looks over the book that Jody gifted her as she holds Madison's braid in her hand. Norman comes inside and calls out to Claire. She hears him, but she doesn't answer. She only looks in the direction of his voice before turning back to her own reflection. When she turns back to the mirror, her eyes are green. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Norman goes into the kitchen and takes an apple from the fridge. When he closes it, Claire is standing there. She greets him with, hello, Dr. Spencer, before calling his apple forbidden fruit and pulling it out of his hand. It's <laughs> what he, she's like, hello, Dr. Spencer. He's like, well, hello, Mrs. Spencer. Yeah. <laughs> He's like a cartoon <laughs> character. <laughs> she's clearly not your Something wife is right going now. Yeah. <laughs> Something <laughs> horrible is going on. <laughs> But she says it's forbidden fruit and she takes it and then she's like, you got a problem with that? And just leaves the room. Norman follows her confused and steps into the hallway in time to see Claire around another corner holding a candle. When he finds her, she's sitting on the stairs in his office eating the apple. The candle is placed between her feet on the floor and when she sees Norman, she slowly opens her legs. Norman's like, well, all right then. <laughs> He yeah. asks if this means that she's not mad at him anymore as he takes his jacket off, but she tells him she wouldn't go that far. She lets out a laugh before picking up the candle and walking over to Norman. She's acting <laughs> very strange. Yeah. Yes, she laugh, is. I would be like, okay. Yeah. Uh, what's going on? 
Hey. Who have you been talking to? <laughs> <laughs> JP, if uh, Nay's eyes were suddenly green. Yeah, no, you <laughs> go, go, why don't you lay down here and take a nap? <laughs> yeah. like, just stay and he just room. runs yeah. as fast <laughs> as he can. <laughs> But she sets the candle down and presents him with the apple to bite. But she hurts his mouth, I guess, by pressing it in too Ooh, hard when geez. he does. No, dude. I This I couldn't handle. We've discussed. The apple? Yes. <laughs> your teeth. Well, I won't eat an apple regular like that because of... And look, there's nothing wrong with my teeth I, and I want to keep it that way. <sighs> Have we talked about this on here on Talk Mortem? On Talk Mortem. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was just telling Jules that you were clowning me about my teeth. Because you won't eat a sandwich. I'll eat a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait. What's in the sandwich? <laughs> That's important. <laughs> my point exactly. All right. But she licks the apple juice off his face. And when they start to kiss, she bites him. He tells her that it's too rough. And she asks, since when? She pushes him down on his desk and crawls on top of him, ripping open his shirt. The buttons go flying and he literally goes, <laughs> that was a brand new shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're worried about the wrong shit, dude. <laughs> Why is it funnier that he, yeah. said, that he said brand? <laughs> if he just said new, it wouldn't be anywhere near this as fun. This was fun. a $5,000 suit. <laughs> But she starts to take off his belt. And when he begins talking, she tells him, why don't you just shut up, professor? And the professor shuts up. She tells him again, calmly, before starting to kiss him. We see Claire's hand, still clutching Madison's braid, is sliding over to the letter opener. She's distracted when she hears the whispers again. And she turns around and in a mirror, she sees the front door open. Claire stands there, drenched in rain and looking shocked. The Claire in the room's eyes glow green. Norman looks up at what she's looking at, but there's nothing in the reflection of the mirror. Claire finally turns back to Norman and with a smirk and an unfamiliar accent <laughs> tells Norman, I think she's starting to suspect something. Norman asks, who? Claire leans into Norman, her face morphing into Madison Franks as she leans down, and she replies, your wife. Woo. Iconic <laughs> moment. Yeah. Never forgot it from the first time I saw it. No. Excellent. Excellent. No, I, I, excellent. I love it, but I think Scary Movie did it better. Oh, come on. Just, <laughs> just that tiny little part. Just. Just, <laughs> but I'm the, I don't... <laughs> I, no, I know. I have no. to say. I just have to say something. I knew coming here today that exact. <laughs> oh no! Yeah. Oh that no! That exact yeah. sentence was going to happen. I should have written it in my notes just to. You I knew you were going to say that. But it's the, fantastic. <laughs> the fact that he just sees nothing. Yeah. Look, she literally goes. I think she's starting to suspect something. Like, are you doing it, Jodie Foster? I was going to say, yeah. Jodie Foster. Why are you talking like that? She had like an accent. I, oh yeah. Look, here's the deal. I've known Claire for all of maybe an hour. Yeah. I knew she was possessed. <laughs> yeah. No shit. This is your <laughs> wife. <laughs> Your spouse, your betrothed. Yeah, yeah. This is, it's just embarrassing. But Norman freaks the fuck out and yeets Claire off of him, causing he, her to drop the braid. He throws her across the room. Yeah. Launches her. <laughs> he got scared. <laughs> he did. <laughs> I will say, and I, I forgot to mention this earlier because I was distracted by the apple in the shirt, but... <laughs> Earlier, she bit his lip really hard, and she goes, "What's the matter?" That's really funny. <laughs> yeah, and, and I just wanted to make mention of that. But then again, at that point, shouldn't he have known that something weird was going yes, on? Yeah, yes. and things just get weirder and weirder. Yeah, and then he throws her off as if it's always been Claire, and there's nothing like. Yeah, it's so yeah. weird. I just don't get his reaction. Yeah. Not at all. But Claire finally comes back to herself and stares at Norman. She tells him, "You know," she says that she knows. She was there. She remembers everything now. She says it was right before the accident. She heard whispering when she came home and she saw Norman in the mirror with Madison in his office. She remembers Madison at the DuPont party staring at her. That was why she couldn't breathe. That was why she dropped the glass. Norman tries to explain. It was a year ago and they were having troubles. Claire asks him, so he slept with a student? He tries to touch her, but she's having none of it. She yells at him to get out, and when he doesn't budge, she goes to the closet to get her coat. She yells that she gave up everything for him, her life and her music. 
But he says that he never asked her to quit, but she insists that he didn't have to. He wanted to be a perfect daddy, which meant a perfect wife and a perfect family. That's not how Norman remembers it, though. He says that Claire was a single mom touring with the baby when she met him, and she was happy to give it all up. Then she grew to resent him for it and gave herself to Caitlin only. Claire's like, leave her out of this. <laughs> well, yeah. I, this this threw me off. I think earlier I was like, well, Nor she was like one when Norman came around or whatever. But in those pictures, it was Caitlin's fourth birthday, and Claire and her first husband were in the picture. Yeah. Because right now he's like, you were touring with the baby, blah, blah, blah. She well, had to be at least four. Maybe there was just a separate baby. It was her opening act. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're right. I mean, I don't know. You were touring with the baby. You couldn't wait to give that shit up. Because <laughs> that baby was <laughs> outperforming you every night. <laughs> and you couldn't handle it. <laughs> Getting bested <laughs> by a <laughs> <your> baby. <laughs> Shut up, Norman. <laughs> you leave that baby out of there. <laughs> But Norman is in confession mode. In the midst of all of this, someone bright and attractive took an interest in him and he slipped. God help him, he slipped. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not going so well for no, now. No, Norman, not. stop. Just yeah, just stop. be quiet. This dude. is when <laughs> things started feeling like really old fashioned with the melodrama. Yeah. The Look, God help me, he yeah. slipped. He does well. No, he's great. And the fact that like, you cheated on me with her in, in our house. Yeah. And he's like, look, she was really smart yeah. <laughs> and gorgeous. And yeah, I fucked up. You know, it's like, don't be complimenting her. Yeah. Well, These are your excuses. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't understand. Did you yeah, see her right. graduation photo? I mean, like. <laughs> right. You did the detective work. I know. <laughs> you know what she looks like. Norman, get out. <laughs> <laughs> Cut his mic. <laughs> But he says that he tried to break it off and Claire only tells him that he should have tried harder before leaving the house and slamming the door behind her. At Jody's house, Jody admits that she saw Norman in a cafe in an artsy hipster village called Adamant sitting with a young blonde woman. So I'm sorry. I know Jody is her like best friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've been sitting on this? Yeah. But I kind of... Let her finish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She says that at first she didn't think anything of it and went to say hello, but they started arguing in a way that stopped her. Then a few days later, Claire was in the accident and Stan called Jody from the hospital. He was asking if Jody had been with her that day and if Claire had seemed upset, insinuating that Claire had wrapped her car around a tree on purpose. So Jody realized that this meant Claire must have found out. She said she went to the hospital and Norman was so desperate at the thought of losing her. She knew she couldn't say anything. She tearfully begs Claire not to hate her, but Claire tells her that she doesn't. I fully, I, I get this after seeing him and seeing, oh my God, she almost died and she probably knew um, and that's why all this happened. So mm -hmm. why bring it up again or embarrass her by telling her that I know the only thing that I cannot get with is the fact that the accident happened a few days after you saw this. Yes. So you did sit on that for a few days. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm showing my ass in the cafe and being like, hey, Norman, who's this? Yeah. I'm his wife's friend. That's me. That's what I would have done. Well, because you're a good friend. Yeah. But she, you sat on this for three days and then we're like, oh, no, they'll, they'll work it out. <laughs> <laughs> that That's what's weird to me. That's yeah, none of my if business. It, <laughs> if it happened the same night. Yeah. I, yes. I, but the fact that a few days later, she's like, oh, I guess she found out. Yeah. <laughs> like, you could have met, had tea really? together or something. Yeah. <laughs> and you're just like, I didn't see anything. Yeah. No, you're not going <laughs> to cheat. What are you talking about? You're Jenny? not going to cheat on my best friend. And I physically see it. Right. And then I just go home and act like nothing. At, no, I'm well, not. That was weird. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can understand her because if they're already having problems, she's not with her kid's dad. She's with this dude. Yeah, but this was only a year ago. Yeah, they've, they've been, been together married. forever yeah, so at this have. point. Yeah. yeah. I, at the very least, she should have said something to Norman that day. Yeah. Hey, Norman, where's yeah, Claire? Yeah, she should have I, said I something to him. Because even that, it, that's not confrontational. That's just you saying hi to your wife's husband. Or like, yeah. I see you. Yeah. Yes. I see you. And then, I, yeah. if at the very <laughs> least, you and I are talking about this. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, at, yeah. The, at best. And then you know yeah. exactly how guilty he is if he steps away from the table. He's like, hey, Jody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> we're, we're planning a surprise party for Claire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's Jody, exactly what we're doing. Jody, I slipped. I slipped. God help me. I slipped. <laughs> but the phone rings and they let the machine pick up it's norman looking for claire he asks 
Sorry, I just I saw something in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> I said he's like, it's Norman. My wife was a ghost. She tried to seduce me. Call <laughs> me <laughs> back. <laughs> <laughs> but what did he really say? He asked her to have Claire call him. Claire says that she can't talk to Norman right now. And she asked Jody to call him and tell him she'll be home in the morning because she needs to ask him something. She's very calm right here. She's pretty yeah. calm about it. I will say there there is a very smart choice I talked about on commentary where like 98% of this scene is Claire's reaction to what she's being told. Yeah. You don't really see Jody at all. And so you see her go through like all these stages yeah. of everything she's hearing. And mm-hmm. she does end up very weirdly calm. Yeah. Well, because I mean, like you've gotten the confirmation. You already exploded on him and now you've left. I feel like she's like fucking in shock. Maybe. Okay. You would yeah. never think he would do this. And with the student, I mean, it's just, no, yeah. it's a bomb that keeps on exploding and she's missing and she's haunting you. Like it just, it doesn't oh, stop. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's <laughs> no. a lot more. To yeah. it. <laughs> I was thinking just the infidelity. No, no, <laughs> no you're going. right. Yeah. Holy <laughs> shit. She's probably in shock. Yeah. That poor woman. Yes. How do you get rid of a ghost mistress? You don't. <laughs> like, what are I, I don't think, I don't know if there's rules for that. <laughs> But the next morning in the pouring rain, Claire comes home. Once inside, she calls out to Norman, but doesn't get an answer. She heads upstairs, but when she tries the lights, they don't work. Water is running when she approaches the bathroom. The door is ajar and Claire pushes it open the rest of the way. She finds Norman in the bathtub, unconscious with the shower running. She runs to him screaming and finds her dryer plugged into the wall and hanging in the tub. Later, Norman is in bed, being checked out by paramedics and by his doctor friend, Stan. Elena has accompanied him and comforts Claire as Norman signs his release papers and maintains that he's not going to the hospital unless they have a cure for clumsiness. I just have a couple things here. One, uh, you got a doctor coming or you can't put a shirt on? Like, Jesus. No. Uh, <laughs> He's like, I'm Harrison Ford. <laughs> yeah. No. I will do as I please. Uh, but the other thing is that the two paramedics, one of them is an actual paramedic in Vermont. Cool. cool All right. Cool. And the other one is the assistant casting director of the film. Oh, that's awesome. All right. But he apologizes to Claire and tells her that he's glad she came home. Claire sees Stan and Elena out, and Stan mentions that if that breaker hadn't popped... But Claire already knows. He warns Claire to not keep anything electrical next to the tub, and they all laugh as Stan and Elena leave. My yeah. husband almost died. What? <laughs> like they're all chuckling. Too yeah. soon. Yeah. He's literally still up there shirtless yeah. and yeah. recovering. <laughs> recovering, yes. So he dropped a hair dryer in the tub with them? Yes, on accident. He knocked the hair dryer into the tub. And then the breaker popped and nothing happened to him. Uh huh. But he passed out. Well, know. that was very scary. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I if that know. breaker had popped, yeah, yeah, yeah no, I would absolutely have fainted. <laughs> <laughs> but Claire closes the door and looks back upstairs where Norman is. She snags Madison's braid and tucks it into the book. Okay. I don't know why she's still hanging on to this braid like Millhouse's teeth. She, I yeah. just want to say she just thinks it's neat. <laughs> I just, I don't understand. I don't understand. This, you need to get this back to her mother. Yeah, yeah. you do. <laughs> God damn it, dude. And later? No. Yeah. That's what, yeah. As she's passing the stairs, Norman comes down. He tells her that he left a message to her on Jody's machine. Claire doesn't even entertain this and flat out asks Norman if he had anything to do with Madison's disappearance. Norman tells her, yes. Claire looks shocked at this, but Norman explains that they had an affair and when he tried to break it off, she became unstable. She came to their house and threatened to either kill herself or Claire, but he didn't think she'd actually go through with it, but then she disappeared. Claire says that what happened in the tub was Madison. She tried to kill him and she lays it all out. He had an affair with the girl who threatened to kill herself and now there's a presence in their house that's a young blonde girl. I just want to stop you for just two seconds because I'm about to blow you guys' minds. Mm -hmm. The marketing for this film, right? Mm -hmm. That line is in the trailer. (gasps) Ah, That is egregious because we yeah. shouldn't even know we yeah. should think that norman's a good 
like exactly wow yeah and for some reason on commentary they commended the marketing of this film i was oh, like oh that's you are, yes yeah. no yikes but yeah, yeah you don't need that no this what's going on now is like an hour 20 yeah, and an hour yeah. 30 far. and yeah. we, if we know that going in and he's all like being buddy buddy with her at it's the like, beginning oh, no, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. i know i you. got your number yeah but i just i don't know why you would ever do that no. No. Indy, not yeah. today and then that negates the entire like first hour of the movie because we know it's not mary yeah yeah that's trash like that's horrible marketing uh-uh. wow horrible <laughs> But she says that Madison did this. She's dead and now she's trying to hurt him or both of them. Norman says that they don't know that she's dead, but Claire says that they do. Suddenly, she realizes that this is all her fault. She opened the door after stealing Madison's braid. She did this. But you did see her before you stole the braid. Yeah, I was You saw her say. before you even knew who she was. That's to true. go to her house and steal the braid. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can't remember now because it feels like a million years ago, but did they do the Ouija board before she started seeing her specifically in the house? Or was it after? She It was before because she's they were still chanting Mary Fjord. Oh, you're right. Okay, oh, so she, yeah. she didn't even yeah. know who it was. Well, because the dog like fucked everything up. They didn't even get to say goodbye. No, they didn't. So, Which you always do. You always oh, say goodbye. Oh, yeah. Because now you love... They, she, <laughs> yeah. it, it is her fault. Now you got a lawsuit on your hands. <laughs> But Norman tells her that there is no door. There are no ghosts. It was an accident and it's not her fault. He tells her to repeat that it was just an accident and it's not her fault. Claire can't do this, though. She abruptly tells Norman that she didn't sleep last night and she needs to lie down. She heads upstairs, telling him that she needs to be alone for a while. Later, Norman calls a friend in his office to hook him up with the paranormal psych guy. He tells him to have him call him back at the house today. Norman's got a guy for everything. <laughs> well, he says the who you going to call guy. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I was like, bitch, get out of so here. So you're making fun yeah. of him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. He's trying to help you. You want my help <laughs> yeah, or not? Oh, shit. <laughs> he goes upstairs and properly puts a blanket on Claire, who is asleep in the bed. When he moves it, he finds the book underneath the blanket, the one that Jody gave her. He takes it with him as he leaves the room. But once the door is closed, Claire opens her eyes, revealing herself to be awake. I hope you guys like that shot. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) Norman looks over the book in his office, focusing on a picture titled, A Spirit is Exercised by Means of the Burning Hand. Norman jots down <laughs> proposed suggestion, exorcism, by fire, in yeah. like big words. Well, like, so you're going to set her on fire? No, what? what? <laughs> Fucking hereditary? Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? Uh, Norman, put the book down. <laughs> the phone rings and it's the sight guy. Norman is immediately annoyed when the guy thinks that Norman is his father, but he corrects him, saying that his father died a couple years ago. He tells the man that someone close to him believes she's in contact with the spirit. He says that there's not a history of delusional behavior and asks if it's possible that this person could be causing these manifestations. He listens, asking if there's anything else that it could be. He's surprised by what he's hearing, asking if this has been documented. Outside the window, he sees that Claire has left the house and is walking to the dock and he abruptly gets off the phone. (laughs) I'm gonna go. (laughs) He calls out to Claire, who's made it all the way to the end of the dock and is staring into the water. She doesn't answer him. She clutches Madison's braid in her hand. And when Norman approaches her, she turns and looks at him. Will you quit touching that <laughs> yeah. hair? Like, God. Jesus. Nothing good is coming from you touching that hair so, much, so often. Keep it in an envelope or something. What the fuck? Like, but so not often. Yours. Well, yeah. Take a break. <laughs> it's getting out of hand. You know, you have one hour of hair time a day. Yeah. You are on restriction. This is unhealthy. (laughs) But without a word, she turns back toward the water and allows herself to fall in. She swims all the way down to the bottom where she sees a box with a familiar looking symbol on it. She starts to grab for it, but Norman grabs her and pulls her out of the water. She asks where the braid is and he doesn't know what she's talking about. He's like, he's like choking on her. (laughs) But he finds it in the water and Claire tells him that she took it from Madison's house. Norman is appalled, asking if this is Madison Frank's hair. And Claire doesn't answer, but she doesn't need to. Back inside, they sit in front of the fireplace. Norman places the braid inside, douses it with lighter fluid and sets it on fire. That poor mother. 
She's never going to be able to replace that. No. No, that is a like one-time ca- yeah, thing. Yeah, no, yeah. You can't, you can't order more on Amazon. I can- no, <laughs> you can't. Yeah, we'll get a six-pack of, yeah, yeah. of what Madison's a, hair. That's sh- <laughs> so shitty. One for Claire, of course. Yeah. <laughs> she can't fucking live she without yeah, it. <laughs> one hour, I'm serious. <laughs> he asks Claire what she thinks, and she admits that she really doesn't know. She calls his name, but before she can ask the question, he answers it. Yes, I believe you. We watch the braid as it shrivels up, as it's burned. Like Ed and Lorraine believe, or uh, like, <laughs> I mean. What are we? Yeah. <laughs> the next day, Norman returns home from work and is immediately greeted by Cooper. He hears a cello being played and follows the music to see Claire playing. He remarks that she's playing and Claire says she's gone. He asks her how she knows, and she says that she can feel it. I do want to point out that Claire is wearing all black. Yes. Big which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Shift. I did want to share something I learned on the commentary that kind of, I was very impressed, but it also made no sense in the context of the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Claire talking about playing the cello for so long and then looking over at it kind of wistfully, mm-hmm. finally getting to see her play it is nice. Mm-hmm. But they had said that Michelle Pfeiffer actually played the cello in this scene. They had gotten the second chair of the Los Angeles Orchestra or Symphony to teach her how to play the cello. Oh, nice. And they said they have cuts of her playing full songs that just don't See, end up in the film. That is what it just <laughs> what? makes me think yeah. that this was a bigger plot point that got cut out. It's so strange. And that just, yeah. ma- that just like makes me feel like I'm right. No, I think you're right. Because why else? And you, uh, to hire someone to teach her. That's yeah. wild. And so I don't know, but, but I would the, have liked to see more of that. The cello oh, yeah. is so beautiful. I would love to learn how to play that. I bet too on the cool though, just having that opportunity to Hell have yeah. such a badass teach you. Yeah. Yeah. That would be cool. Yeah. It would. For sure. But Norman comes over to her telling her that he picked up that book that she ordered When Claire's eyes fill with tears and she doesn't respond, he tells her that he doesn't know how to apologize to her for what he's done. But if she'll just give him another chance, he'll spend the rest of his life making her glad that she did. He asks her, please, and she quietly holds his hand. We cut to them on a boat. He says it's the last sail day of the year and they should take a drive before the leaves are all gone and stay at a bed and breakfast. Claire proposes that they go look for antiques and Norman agrees they haven't done that in a while. This is what I was like, yes. <laughs> Claire suddenly mentions adamant. She says it's supposed to be charming and asks if Norman has ever heard of it. He's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and Claire says maybe they'll stop there for lunch. I was like, see, you're not fucking dead. Yeah. You're no. not dead. She's still I was in there. Glad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but as Norman ties the boat up to their vehicle, Claire comes up behind him and hugs him. He asks what that was for, and she says nothing. The two kiss, but when Norman goes back to securing the boat, Claire just stares off into the distance. Later, she sits in the bathtub. Her robe suddenly falls off of the bathroom door, and when she leans over to pick it up, that mystery key that she found falls out. We cut to Claire arriving in Adamant. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I was like, man, she's being a little too cool. Way you know too, what I mean? Yeah. But she's waiting. She's like, huh, so, yeah, yeah, love it. Mm -hmm. She looks at the Adamant Cafe right next to a store called the Sleeping Dog. Claire walks up to the Sleeping Dog and looks through the windows. She finds the same unique necklaces that Madison was wearing in the picture. And there are little boxes with those mystery keys sticking out of them. Interesting, first of all. Very mm-hmm. much. Secondly, the idea of the store being called what? The sleeping dog? Uh-huh. Yeah. Let them lie. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's a liar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. But okay, hold on though. But if a dog's asleep, how's he gonna lie? Uh, he's not really asleep. Yeah, he's fucking with you. He was waiting until Norman left the room and then he opened his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that night, back at home, as Norman sleeps in the bed, Claire gets up with the key and leaves the room. As soon as she closes the door behind her, Norman opens his eyes. <laughs> just like before. Yeah, you know. it's a parallel. Just, yeah. like, just like that dog we were talking the about. Dog, yeah. The lying dog. <laughs> Claire heads down to the end of the dock with a flashlight and pulls the key out of her pocket. When she comes back in the house, she's carrying one of those boxes from the sleeping dog, but it's completely waterlogged. When Claire puts the mystery key inside, it opens. Why are you digging up buried treasure while Norman's home? 
I don't care that he's asleep. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah. I do not you care. You know that you can fake being asleep because you just you did, did it. Yeah. <laughs> you invented it and then yeah. like this is bad. Plus, what's in the box? <laughs> what's yeah. in the box? <laughs> She rifles through the box, and when she pulls out Madison's necklace, she scurries away, horrified. She goes straight to the phone and starts to dial, but freezes when she hears something. She moves quietly into the living room, looking up at the stairs for signs of Norman, but he's already in the next room. He startles her when he speaks, telling her that she doesn't understand what this is. But she does. She tells him it's Madison's necklace and asks if he killed her. I'd be like, you know what, Norman? I don't. Yeah. I don't know what any of this is, but I'm going to take it real quick. And I'm just going to go stay with Jody for a while. <laughs> I'm still mad. Yeah. I'm still upset. Mm-hmm. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. I've not put anything together. No, not at all. I couldn't be more clueless yeah. at all. <laughs> the one thing I know is you're innocent. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, and that's what cheater, I'm going to tell but that's everyone. It. <laughs> I'm going to go tell Jody right yeah. now. Hello, police. but he says he didn't kill her he didn't kill anyone he's appalled that she could think that and explains that madison killed herself and their house to destroy him when he came home she was already dead claire asks if norman thinks that she's stupid but he continues madison left that box here for claire along with the letter he burned the letter and threw the box into the lake He says that a week before she had shown up at the DuPont party and he was terrified. So he agreed to meet her at their house when she told him to. But when he got there, she'd already taken pills and she was already dead, even though he tried to bring her back. He insists that there was nothing he could do. So he put her in her car and drove over the boat ramp and put the car in a lake. There was nothing he could do. That, that's the only, I mean, when I can't think of anything to do, I, you know, drive into a lake. I dispose of a, a body. Yeah. Yeah, but he didn't kill her. <laughs> he admits that he made a mistake but he asked oh, if he was how, really yeah. <laughs> how big of him <laughs> wow Norman <laughs> but he asked if he was really supposed to sacrifice their marriage and the work he spent his life on he tells her that they can put this all behind them and it's not too late for them to just go on with their lives Claire asks exactly what he's asking her to do, and he simply begs for forgiveness on his knees. After a moment of contemplation, Claire tells him that the girl must be brought up and hands him the phone. He stares at Claire as he dials the police. He says that he has information on a missing person, Madison Frank. He asks for them to send an officer to the house, gives the address, and hangs up the phone. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, dude. You're going to need to put that on speaker. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I've, really? Yeah. I've seen way too many. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying you're a liar. No. Yeah. I just like. <laughs> right, put it so we can both hear. Exactly. Yeah, like, <laughs> let's put our ears together. I haven't seen this movie in a very long time, but literally when this happened, all I thought was at the tone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the time will be. 8 30 <laughs> i'm like oh god but yeah so let's let's go ahead and let both of us hear that when claire doesn't say anything norman goes upstairs to get dressed leaving claire alone to look down at the box when claire walks upstairs she's wearing madison's necklace the bathroom door is cracked open and the shower is running claire notices the phone sitting on a table and at first she walks past it But after pulling on her robe, she goes back. She picks up the phone suspiciously and peeks into the bathroom before hitting redial. Norman hadn't called 911. He dialed 411 (laughs) information. (laughs) Suddenly, he appears behind her. He was never in the shower. He just lies on lies on lies. The lies, the lies. Wow. He brings a cloth to her mouth as she screams. In their struggle, the phone and a vial are both dropped to the floor. (laughs) I was like, that old ass, what was it, laudanum? (laughs) What are we doing here? Uh, I did appreciate, and they brought it up on commentary, there is a lot of silence in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Until he grabs her, and then the music is like, no, we're here. Yeah. Yeah. Very smart choices. Claire tries to fight him, knocking everything over in the hallway and finally managing to slam the bedroom door on his hand. He's forced to let her go and Claire runs downstairs past the dropped phone. When she gets to the ground floor, her legs give out from underneath her. On the ground, she uses all of her strength to pull herself across the floor with her arms. But soon this becomes impossible too and she can't move at all. 
Norman walks up to her, saying that he begged and pleaded with her, but she just wouldn't let it go. He laments that he never wanted any of this to happen. He only wanted for her to love him, be proud of him, and be happy. He confesses that Madison was going to the dean and it would have ruined them. He asks if Madison really just thought he would sit there and let that happen. He continues, saying that he held her underwater and watched her life slip away. He maintains that he didn't have a choice and he goes down on the ground to whisper in her ear and neither have you. He carries her up the stairs, saying that he doesn't understand how she figured it all out. He thought she knew the truth and was just lying about the ghost thing to trap him until he realizes she actually believed it. He calls it a passive aggressive masterpiece. Okay, he needs to calm down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's he's absurd. gone really just full villain. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, he's like monologuing. Like, yes. It's like he's he's gone. Like he's possessed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And to see Harrison Ford as a villain is interesting it's yeah. a treat honestly and he plays it he so does, well he does it really well i did want to talk when he leans down to whisper into her ear the camera does a yes a absolutely bonkers thing yeah and it kind of glides and dips underneath in one fluid motion yeah so very ridiculously on commentary they basically were being like magicians and they're like we're not gonna tell you how we did that <laughs> <laughs> But it was very clear that it was some combination of practical and CG. Right. Must have been a glass floor. Must have yeah. been, oh, you know, yeah. and covered with like some kind of CG panels or something. Yeah. But I did want to call it the cinematographer who is Don Burgess because the cinematography from this point forward gets very interesting. Mm -hmm. It was already very interesting with all the long takes and the sweeping motions and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But what we see from the tub, the mirrors, all this stuff, the things later, I don't want to yeah. say, but... um. Don Burgess, he he did Forrest Gump, it, like everything from that to The Conjuring 2. Like, oh, wow. All, all over the place and with a lot of really, really prolific, prolific directors. Mm -hmm. But I think his work here does not get enough credit. No, it's great. Yeah. People don't talk about it enough. Yeah. But he carries Claire to the bathroom and places her inside the bathtub where the shower head is still running. Obviously, she has been got with the halothane that they were fucking with that rat with earlier. Yeah. It's very interesting that they just told you everything. Yeah. yeah. And you well, don't I was even. Like, yeah, I'm sure yeah. this is not going to come into play ever. Oh, of course you know? not. He says that when he met her, all he wanted was to spend the rest of his life with her. But that's not going to happen now. He stares at her for a moment before turning off the shower and putting the stopper into the tub. He starts running the water and remarks that it's cold. He says he almost froze to death himself laying here. <laughs> pretending to be electrocuted and waiting for her to find him. Well, we knew. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Norman. Cooper comes over to see what's going on and Norman drags him away, calmly telling the dog that they'll go find his ball. Claire is left alone to watch the water rapidly rising in the tub while she can do nothing about it. Norman comes back in on the phone with Jody. He says that he and Claire had a terrible brawl and he's going to go sleep in the lab. I guess we're in the 50s again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he asks her to come check on Claire in the morning. Claire can do nothing but breathe rapidly as she looks at her conniving husband. As he speaks, though, she's doing the old Beatrix kiddo and wiggling her big toe. Very good. Mm -hmm. Norman gets off the phone and comes back to the tub. He notices Claire's <laughs> hand and foot shaking and remarks that the halothane is starting to wear off. I was just laughing at you saying he's back in the 50s. He gets off the phone. He's like, 23 skadoos. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? That's how he leaves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, did he just say, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> He goes to the medicine cabinet and takes out a bottle of pills, assuring Claire that in some tragic way, her suicide is going to bring him and Caitlin closer together. But he says that every time he'll look at Caitlin, he'll see her. What a guy, huh? Yeah, right. he's Scientist, a, father, father, dog the year, father. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> dog father. Dog father. <laughs> it was like, Cooper's like, it's about yeah, goddamn yeah. time. <laughs> I get something out of this thing. Some recognition. <laughs> He looks at Claire for a second before leaning in and kissing her lips. He notices the necklace around her neck, but it's on backwards down her back. He lifts her up to see if it's Madison's. But when her head flops back as he goes to put her back down, it's Madison's face dead and blue. Ooh. This got me. Like I said, I've seen this <laughs> yeah, movie a hundred times and I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I was not. Still. It looks like seamless. You don't yeah. think. I don't know. It and got me. You're not at all expecting this. No. no. But this scares the shit out of Norman. <laughs> he does not handle fear very well at all. Dude. <laughs> he, 
He like threw himself. He back. does. <laughs> he breaks a light bulb with his spine, dude. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he goes flailing backward, knocking the shower head into the tub and slipping and busting his head on the side of the sink. He hits the floor. I do want to say they said on commentary, Harrison Ford did most of his own stunts. Ooh. Damn. And that was one of them. Ooh. It looks bad. Oh, yeah. Like, it, the way he hits that sink, I yeah. yeah. Ooh. Ugh. The water is up to Claire's chin when Norman reaches up, his hands bloody from his head wound. He stains the side of the tub and reaches toward Claire like he's going to strangle her before finally passing out and hitting the floor. I was like, Gerald, <laughs> get up. <laughs> Able to move more of her foot now. Sorry, Cooper just starts eating him. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what am I watching? Oh my God. Claire grabs the chain to the stopper with her toes and pulls it with all of her strength. The water is still on, though, and as Claire continues to yank harder, the chain breaks, leaving the stopper halfway open and halfway closed. Claire is able to reach the shower head as the water goes past her mouth and nose. She pulls on it, and its cord slightly moves the knob for the hot water. Claire closes her eyes as the water raises over her. Fully submerged now, at the very last minute, she's able to pull the shower head hard enough to turn off most of the stream. She gathers every ounce of strength to slam her foot down on the chain for the stopper to pull out. The water goes down and Claire is finally able to gasp for air. She flexes her hand open and shut as the tub empties and she regains some control of her body. So did he die or what? What the fuck happened? I know. We oh, just, he's, yeah. we just don't see him. Yeah. Yeah. We don't worry. It was funny as he was like, I still got 1% left. Yeah, yeah, and then he's like, no, I'm not yeah he's gone. Um, I have two points that are connected, but first I want to commend the editing in this section. Yeah. It was done by Arthur Schmidt and he has done a lot of Zemeckis' films. Mm -hmm. So again, working with all these people the same. But I do want to admit that as a kid, I did not know that film editing existed. Yeah. And so whenever this was going on, I thought that Michelle Pfeiffer was yeah. doing all this yeah. Yeah. in one take. I would try to hold my breath. I did the exact yeah. same yeah. thing. I didn't make it. Yeah. Oh, I, no, I'm dead. No. Any, oh, anything oh, yeah. where yeah. I have to hold my breath. And it's I also, a wrap. I had the tiny lungs of a nine-year-old, so I wasn't <laughs> even. <laughs> I don't know why I thought I could do it. I couldn't. I still have the tiny lungs of a nine <laughs> But she's slowly able to lift herself to the rim of the tub where the glass and blood on the floor remains. But Norman is gone, leaving a visible ass blood trail in his escape. <laughs> Claire tries to get out of the tub, but manages to fall onto the floor instead. She crawls into their bedroom and uses the dresser to pull herself to her feet before stumbling over to the phone. When she picks it up, though, there's only a busy signal. She sees Norman's shadow under the door and hangs up. Claire goes back into the bathroom and arms herself with a huge jagged piece of glass from the mirror that Norman crashed into. <laughs> Real quick, I know they do this on a lot of movies, but if you grab a shard of glass like that, yes. you're going to fucking cut your no, head. No, yeah, she's grabbing it like a knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it had yeah, a handle. Yeah, you're not... Like I, it had a handle. Yeah. <laughs> she did. She I did. was like, oh, no, you'd be bleeding already. Yeah. That's and crazy. And she's just fine. Yeah. Before she rounds the corner in the hallway, she uses the glass shard as a mirror. The coast is clear and she continues to the stairs where she walks down quietly, slowly and backwards. She screams, though, when she steps on blood and notices Norman sprawled on the floor downstairs. She creeps past him and when she sees that he has collapsed on the other phone, which is buzzing out a busy signal, she reaches for it, trembling and whimpering. Norman's hand twitches and Claire screams again. She finally gives up and snatches his cell phone off the charger, grabs the car keys and runs out of the house. The second she makes it outside, Norman opens his eyes. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> outside, Claire gets into Norman's car. But when the key doesn't fit into the ignition, she looks in the side mirror at his truck, the one with the boat attached to it. She opens the door and we stay on the side mirror. While the door is open, we see Norman stand in the window. And when the door closes, we see Claire run to the other vehicle. But when she looks in the mirror back at the house, the rocking chair on the porch is moving. The shot of the mirror, oh. it was fucking great. Yeah. I loved that. That's fantastic. And is this when the music starts going basically psycho? It's Yeah, it's, yeah. it is. <laughs> yes. It's so close. She races down the bridge, waiting to get service on the cell phone. Once she reaches the middle, the phone beeps green with service. She slows the vehicle to a stop when she notices movement on the covering of the boat. But she grabs the cell phone and drops it. 
When she bends down to pick it back up, we see a figure in the back of the vehicle. When she sits back up, Norman breaks the back window and grabs her. Okay, so whenever we were dealing with the side mirror and she was about to pull away, I thought he was going to pull some like Terminator shit and just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. sink into the back. That didn't happen. But I also don't know how the hell he's in this boat. He climbed up there, I guess, before she drove away. Oh, he was yeah. recovering <laughs> inside. <laughs> that, I mean, we'll this allow it. This is Norman Spencer yeah. we're talking about Oh, I'm about sorry. Here. I forgot he was a superhero. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, in all honesty, this got a little Sin City for me, this drive down the bridge. Let me tell you, because I did see um, in a behind the scenes featurette, this is a massive combination of CG and practical. Okay. Because the bridge, like in the shot that we see where the camera meets her in the window, yeah. it's not real. She's sitting in a truck next to a green screen, and so it's a composite. Uh, okay. And it's done so brilliantly. That's why I said the last section, the cinematography, they're just like, let's just do everything. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's wild. And it's it's amazing. Yeah. But uh, that shot in particular, I get what you're talking about. Yeah, I was watching it. I was like, what happened to the movie? I was yeah. like, what the fuck? And let's, let's do this movie now. Yeah. <laughs> It still looks good, but it does. it does look different. Yeah. The phone falls to the floor, but she was already able to dial 911. Claire slams down on the accelerator and they go flying, fishtailing down the bridge. Claire screams to the dropped phone for help, telling them that she's on the bridge. Suddenly, there's a ghostly figure of a woman on the bridge and Claire swerves. Now they're off roading. Claire punches Norman and he goes flying into the bed of the truck as they go out of control. Finally, the truck crashes into the water and a bar goes flying through the windshield, narrowly missing Norman. Whew. There's so much going on right now. Yeah. <laughs> the truck begins to fill up with water and Claire frantically tries to roll down the window, but it's stuck. She tries to swim out of the back, but Norman grabs her. She grabs at the bar and it takes the rest of the windshield with it as it falls deeper into the water, landing below in Madison Frank's car. Norman's foot is pinned, but he grabs Claire as they are both submerged in the water. Claire begs him to think of Caitlin, but Norman pushes her down into the water. Below, though, Madison's body has been released from the tomb of her car and floats up toward them. She turns her head to look straight at Norman, and he's like, blah! <laughs> <laughs> he loses his grip on Claire. He gets scared. He does. <laughs> now, wait, why, if you recall, as the water's rising, does he shush Claire? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, he does. And it's, it's like, it's underwater, so it's like, <laughs> it's like, dude, this is Stop. hilarious. Stop. Why are you doing that? But Claire swims to freedom. Madison, though, holds Norman back. Now free from the lake, Claire sees a police car's lights on the bridge. In the water, Madison's body appears decomposed. She lets go of Norman, who clutches onto her necklace before returning back to the car. <laughs> As Norman realized what was going on, it was like, well, well, well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if it isn't the consequences of my, of my actions. <laughs> he kind of lets it. He's like, this is what it is. It's, yeah. it's what he deserves. Oh, yeah. Norman's grip loosens on the necklace and he drops it. Dead. It floats down in the water with Madison's corpse. But we see her once again going from decomposed to her youthful self. And there is a small smile on her face. So does this mean she's not dead anymore? Um, like she respawned or what? I don't. <laughs> yes. Is she a ghoul or is she not a ghoul? She beat the boss. Oh. <laughs> she won the boss fight. <laughs> in the next scene, Claire visits a cemetery in the snow. She places a red rose on the grave of Madison Elizabeth Frank, now properly laid to rest. She walks away and it fades to black. Now, yes. I, I didn't see this myself until I read it online and then I went back and looked. As it's fading to black in the snow on the ground, you see Madison's face for like a second yeah. before it's totally black. I was like, fuck, <laughs> it is there. In the snow. Yeah. yeah. And on the ground. It's it's frightening. It's a big amount of space that they're putting it's this huge. face on. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't believe I had never noticed it in my entire life. No. But the credits roll. So what did you guys think of what lies beneath? I really enjoyed this movie. I think my only major gripe is that it's a little too long. Um, maybe some of the story. But, I mean, really, it is it is a good movie. Very memorable. Oh, yeah. Very, yes. very iconic moments in this movie. Um, I wish that the friend was in it a little more. Maybe the daughter yeah. came into play a little bit more. Yeah, both. Um, but, I mean, really, it was it's, it's, it's a decent movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I will say that... that 
being a little older and watching it again, it is a little dated. Um, kind of like it doesn't feel like something that could happen now. You I mean guess. like all the stuff with the phones? Yeah, and stuff like with that. the phones and the computer and everything. I mean, because the computer's kind of it you was know. state of the art nah, at the time. <laughs> yes, at the time. Yes. <laughs> um, but I mean that doesn't that doesn't take away from the charm of the movie. No. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, but yeah, no, I still enjoyed it. Yeah, I did too. Um, I was a little, honestly, a little surprised at how well it held up, mm-hmm. especially for how many times we've watched it in the past. Yeah. Uh, I it's just an incredibly well made thriller. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a modern homage to an era of very good films. Yeah, um, has its issues. Twenty three skidoo. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the number they say? I don't know. <laughs> when I said it, I was like, "This makes sense to me," but I don't know <laughs> if it just makes sense know, to me. You were saying like it was like a callback to an era. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I get off the phone. Why, Norman? <laughs> How do you do? That's Norman? what she said. I was like, "What was it again?" <laughs> um, but no, it still holds up. Um, I do really enjoy it still. Uh, and I will admit some of it could be powered by nostalgia and I wouldn't even know. Yeah. yeah. But I definitely can't believe it's been this long since I've watched this film because I'm going to probably start watching it a little more frequently. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree with both of y'all. And if it is kind of colored by nostalgia, it's not in any way where I'm like, oh, that was bad. Because right. sometimes we revisit these and I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> if I watched this for the first time today, I'd probably be like, what the oh. fuck? But this, this, I don't think so. No, I don't yeah. think so either. I mean, all the performances are really good. My my main gripes, again, are it is quite long, mm. and I feel like it doesn't really need to be. And part of the reason I think it might be so long is it feels like there are maybe a lot of rewrites or a lot of dropped plot points that maybe played a factor in some version of this. And then because there's just so much. Yeah. The fact that she's a musician doesn't really come into play. The, you know, we dropped the daughter off. We never see her again. <laughs> that bothers the, me the so best much. Yeah. Friend, I think it's three scenes. I mean, it's, it's very, it feels, and the thing with Norman's father. Yeah. Yeah. It no. feels like a big deal, but we never get why it's, you know, I mean, I get the whole, he's living in a shadow and he, maybe that contributed to some kind of, midlife crisis when he had this affair like i get that but when he's like detailing how much his life sucks or whatever he doesn't even bring up that but i don't know um yeah you're right you know it's just a lot of uh, a lot of little things like that but it doesn't to me amount to anything where it's like yeah i mean what lies beneath is fine it's got problems but i mean it's not even that uh, nothing is that egregious to me no it's just like yeah it's long but it's good (laughs) you know (laughs) it does drag in some areas but it's i feel like it's worth it i think that we are given a real treat of harrison ford playing this character man and playing it so well and Michelle Pfeiffer is just always great. Mm-hmm. And Robert Zemeckis, uh, I owe him for my life. I mean, <laughs> death becomes her. I get, right. You know, I'm forever grateful. Um, <laughs> but overall, I think it's really good. I think it is really iconic that she's starting to suspect something. Who? Your wife? Yeah. I had never seen some shit like yeah. that in my whole life. Nope. That that moment right there, that's a point. You know oh, what I yeah. mean? Like, oh yeah. <laughs> if the rest of it was shit, this movie would get at least one point yeah. for that. It's pretty good. But um I guess we can kind of go into ratings. Sure. Uh I think I kind of just said this one is a lot of fun. I watched it a lot. We watched it a lot when we were younger. Yeah. And it still holds up in a way that I was a little bit worried that it wouldn't. Those moments that hit back then still hit. I genuinely was like, fuck, when he <laughs> when her head flopped back. I yeah. I was I I wasn't expecting that. It's got some good scares in it. It is a bit of a slow burn, what with a very long red herring situation. I like the red herring of us thinking that this is one thing going on, but it's something completely different. Mm-hmm. And I'm always a sucker for those like who the fuck did I marry type of things where it's like, oh, this dude did this a year ago and then just came back home like nothing. And y'all have been living your life like that is horrifying. <laughs> um, I already said like the little plot points that I would have liked fleshed out a little more, but it's still I think this is really, really good. I think it's it's still a compelling story. It's very dramatic it, and the performances are fantastic oh yeah mm-hmm. i maybe just a tighter script would have made this amazing yeah oh yeah but on a scale from one to ten tragic trysts very good 
I'm going to give what lies beneath eight out of 10 tragic trysts. This is not going to be the greatest film you've ever seen in your life, mm-hmm. but I think that everyone should watch it. <laughs> I oh, think yeah. it's really, really good. <laughs> but I will now open up the floor. Yeah, I, I don't think I have much more really to add. I uh-huh. mean, it the one thing that does hurt it for me, and I've said it before, I'm not much of a slow burn guy. Right. Uh, the length does hurt it for me. Not enough for me to be like, oh, no, fuck that. But I mean... <laughs> It because it is a good movie, yes. and like you said, if if just for that one scene, that like, and even that that one scene, I know you said one point, but that's like five all by itself. Yeah, that's <laughs> like fair. really, you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> the performances, their their performances, everybody's performances are are good. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, I, like I said, that I I don't. I feel like after we met the neighbor, I'd be like, you didn't hurt your wife. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was, might be wrong. Yeah, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> but it it is it is good. Watching it now uh, with grown-up eyes, uh-huh. I, I won't say that it hurt anything for it, but it did make some other things funny that shouldn't be funny. And it's not like, oh, well, that's funny people in grief or pain. But it's like, you know what I mean? Like not the cheating and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. like it's just like, oh shit, their responses and the way they act to it is like, what the fuck? No, Norman yeah. was out of pocket no. for 90% yeah, of the like, film. What the hell? It's unbelievable. <laughs> Did Claire ever give that lady her shoe back? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh shit. <laughs> what the fuck? It's like my painting shoes. Did she burn yeah. that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah. It was part of the seance. <laughs> Jeez. But I mean, it is a good movie, and I agree. If you've never seen it, at least watch it and give it a try. Uh, it is a good movie. Uh, it is a bit long, uh, so for that, I I I can't do an eight. But on a scale from one to ten, tragic trysts, I'm gonna give What Lies Beneath a seven point five. Okay. I I like the movie, uh-huh. but the length. Fuck, you killed me with that. And it's not to say that it's not needed, but I feel like, and you, we talked before the show, T, and I think you're right. It's two hours and nine minutes. You can cut 20 minutes of it. If you could shave. That's it. You, you probably could. 20 minutes and and maybe rework some things. Fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Perfect. But yeah, the length and there's a couple of things that I'm like, eh. <laughs> but I mean, overall, it is fantastic movie. Yeah. Uh, this one is one that I'm very glad that we got to revisit. Mm-hmm. It is much different watching this film as an adult. Yeah. I, as a kid, I probably got maybe like 10% of this. Yeah. And yeah. It was probably just the scary ghost shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean, for me on the positives, I want to call out basically all aspects of the filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The cinematography, the set and production design, the editing and the music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I got to say, I, I appreciate the uh, computer enhancements that they use from time to time. Yeah. Because they're not distracting. Yeah. No. There are a few things that um, don't look as well as they did in 2000. Yeah. I will say that. <laughs> that's to be expected. But that's to be expected. And personally, for me, I don't really take off for anything like that. No, yeah. You're doing the best. You- oh, I- I'm sorry. I couldn't go to the future and like figure yeah. out. Like, Minus two points. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I think they did as good as they could at the time. Uh, negatives for me, it really is. That script needs a little work. Yeah. Because there's a lot of things, a lot of dropped ideas, a lot of ridiculous things to me because whenever you start with Claire and her daughter and then you take them to school and show how important Caitlin is to her. Yeah. And then you come back home and then she tells Jody that that's her, like her best friend and she's, you know, and then we try to call her once for the entire film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is that? She was busy. I already told you. Not that busy. She <laughs> yeah. was look. She was busy, but again, if I'm going through it, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna call the closest person to me. Yeah. Oh yeah. And say I need your guidance, your assistance, your, and also you get to the point where you're in your 20s, you kind of become friends with your parents. Yeah. yeah. If you're lucky. If you're lucky, and so that is someone to bounce ideas off of. Hey. Caitlin, I think the house is on it. <laughs> I could really use your wisdom right now. You know, I don't know. I figured that could work out. But the pacing as well, I do very much appreciate the red herring of the viewers. Yeah. Um, I would like it to not take up an hour of the film. It is long. Yeah. 
Because, I mean, once we get into what's going on with Madison, it is a, like, fast yeah. thing. Yeah. And then things just go nuts. Yeah. And do. so, I mean, it's it's very, there really is a first half and a second half. Yeah. yeah. Like, the film just takes off. But, I don't know. I feel like there could be something done. I do appreciate all the homages, of course, and so that helps it out for me. But I just think it's very well made, and I'm going to watch it again uh, sometime soon, probably. Oh, no, for yeah. For sure. It's on HBO Max, not a sponsor. Yeah. So Call us. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're open to it. <laughs> um, but for me, out of 10 tragic trysts, I am also going to give What Lies Beneath 7.5 tragic trysts out of 10. I would go more... But those plot points, you've made them seem so important. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, you know what? We're good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's kind of weird. Never mind. No. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's all from us at Podmortem. What would you rate What Lies Beneath and what should we watch next? Let us know on Twitter at the Podmortem. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook. Be sure to follow each of us on Twitter at Blood and Smoke, at RealStreeter84, and at TravisMWH. Please consider pledging to our Patreon and stay tuned until after the music for a special shout out to our Wendigo Getter patrons. And remember, you can only last for so long adrift on a sea of lies. Ultimately, it's only a matter of time before the truth rises to the surface. Until next time. Thank you for staying tuned for a special thank you to our Wendigo Getter patrons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> we got it. Yeah. yeah. We just mix it up. We about- figure it yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, patrons, how do you do? <laughs> 23 skidoo. <laughs> A special thank you to Chris Ontiveros, Kristen Lofton, Megan Martinez, Kimberly Bass, Sophie Hodson, Anthony Jerome M., Jordan Nash, Kent Morton, Lala Thomas, Travis, and Issa Hunter. Miguel Myers ATX, Jennifer Perez, Allison O'Neill, Carissa, TJ and Angie Bronson, Gabrielle Trevino, Spooky Mom, Andy Teague, Applin Ontiveros, Karima Rhodes, Antonio Huerta, Kimberly Kleindienst, Will Brown, Sydney Smith, Osvaldo Soto, Jonathan, Bobby Holmes, Donna Eason, JD Rizak, Molly Gerhardt, Armand Spasto, Aaron Aguirre, Eggy, Brittany Ramatar, Charity Oxner, Amanda Six, Mandy Rainwater, Eden, Jordan Roberts, Dylan, Melissa Sierra, Holly Bryan, Jordan Blevins, Liz Heath, Spencer Montavo, Pancake the Panda, John Ramos, Michael Newding, Alexis Roberts, Dan Laveau, Itzy M, Gary Horton, Leisha Olivier, Kate Lamp, Carlos and Sydney, Jessica Hunter, Helena Rudder, Alan Johnston, Mariah, Livy Fun, Mandy M, Scott Troutman Wise, Towton Watson, Mozzie Bear, Brittany G, David Burke, Adrian Stakes, Daniel McGinnis, Nick Spill, Emma Hagel Kissinger, Valerie G, Emiliana, Brian Glass, CB, Maya Noches, Taylor Santana, Will Lewison, Angelique, Smelly Poo Poo Head, Beth Bauer, Ben Coons, Cookie, Esperanza J, Jason Kyle, OKC, Joshua Rumley, Danielle Peralta, Hannah R, Brandon, Nicholas Carter, Sawyer Reese Farr, Dr. Diva Loves Horror, Girl That's Scary, M. Fryback, Cassandra, Andrea Simmons, Ashley Higuera, William Rush, Ryan Brom, Megan Ochoa, Laura Lassiter, Natalie de Guzman, Eileen O, Morgan Freenomorph, Marissa E, Sydney, Henry F, Carlos J. Mota, Megan M, Strangely Sarah, Paul Jordan, Christy Beck, Nancy and Andy, Amanda Lopez, Cody Graves, Andy Terrell, Wizard Boner, ML Tafoya, Abigail Spitzer, Katie K, and Erica Morin. Hey! Yeah. Thank you all. So much! So much! Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you good? Well, I was, you know, I'm happy. Yeah. I just want to say that we truly love and appreciate all of you. And that ain't no lies beneath. Sweet Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. Hey, I literally no. just said scream last week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're fine. You're doing a great. You're doing amazing, sweetie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Until next time.